Welcome to the Full Story series, where me and the Comic Story and team compile a collection of our older videos into one giant epic movie. Today you're going to see the entire run for Agent Venom, which in my opinion is one of my favorite comic book characters. Agent Venom's amazing, I love him. I have a separate video explaining why I connect with this character so much, but this is the story of Agent Venom. Over in Eastern Europe, Flash Thompson finds himself jumping headlong into a city being destroyed. A mercenary group is attempting to extract a man who has learned how to weaponize Antarctic Vibranium, and Flash needs to stop them before they can. But during his arrival, he found some of the terrorist soldiers opening fire on the innocents in the city. Flash jumps in to shield the last standing woman, and he fights off the rest of the soldiers. However, as he wraps himself around the woman, he sees a grenade fall out right in front of them. He quickly plugs the pinhole and decides to bring it with him, thinking how this mission is already off to a great start. Using the guns from the other dead soldiers, Flash runs through the alleyway firing in all directions, killing off the remaining soldiers. Then he finds what he's looking for, and he stares down at the barrel of a tank. After getting the woman and the child to safety, Flash goes back and pulls Dr. Ekemic out of the tank. The doctor tells him to release him at once, but Flash tells him, you're actually pretty lucky to be alive. And a green ghost floats over and wraps itself around Flash. A voice then tells him that he has a pretty neat costume. So first, you get a trick, and then Jack-O-Lantern slams his broom down on Flash, telling him, and here's the treat. Jack then grabs the doctor and begins to fly off, and the symbiote starts to creep out from the ghost wrappings. Using the tank next to them, Flash fires a tank shell at Jack to try and stop him. But as he goes to give chase, the woman from before begs him to take her son out of there, so Flash decides to take them with him. While swinging through, Jack comes back, knocking Flash out of the air, causing him and the civilians to begin to fall back down to the streets. Jack then slashes away at Flash's face, and Control radios in, telling him to stay calm. He's losing control of the symbiote. Just then, Flash turns webbing up Jack, and the symbiote punches him back, stating, We're in control now! Jack quickly jumps back and pins Flash down, ready to cut off his head, and that gives Flash another idea. The grenade from before is then thrust into Jack's mouth, and it explodes. Jack begins coughing and calls out to his room to try and escape, but before he can fly far enough off, Flash webs up the doctor and brings him out of Jack's grips, causing him to fall back down to the ground. Later, over at Project Rebirth, General Dodge has the symbiote removed from Flash, telling everyone to get out. He needs to talk to Flash alone. Dodge tells Flash that he had to kill the last soldier that occupied that suit. The man lost control, and soon, Dodge is inches away from ending Flash's life if he lets the symbiote take control like that again. Just know next time, if he ever lets the brute anger sully his Operation Venom again, he'll cut it off. Flash's next mission takes him to the Savage Land, where he's being hunted by Kraven the Hunter. With javelins ready in him, Kraven jumps in, stabbing Flash with one of them. Flash knows that he needs to run. He has to get away from him before anxiety can begin to set in. He needs to remember Betty. As the two of them begin to struggle, Flash manages to stab Kraven, but he just grabs a hold of the spike and cuts the symbiote off. Rage begins to set into Flash as it begins to take over, and Kraven jumps up, hitting and knocking Flash back down to the ground. He decides that he has to run. He can't stay here any longer. He can't let Betty bury another liar. A little while later, Flash wakes up in a cave, regaining control of the symbiote. Once he pulls out the last of the spearheads, he looks at his watch and he sees that it's almost been two days since he bonded with the symbiote. And after a full two days, it can permanently bond with him. Luckily, Command has not set off that failsafe to kill him, yet he only has one bullet left, just in case the symbiote tries to take complete control. He has a mission to complete, but he also can't let Kraven run free. So, he'll have to kill. And just as he's leaving the cave, Kraven appears before him with a strange look in his eye. He knocks him back down into the cave and he tells him to give him what he desires. One final embrace. Flash retreats back further into the cave and he finds himself in a room with giant bats. Ones that can make a lot of loud sonic noises. Things that the symbiote really hates. Craven calls out to him, but as he talks, Flash webs his mouth to stop him from making any noise. He then drags him across the ground, but then Craven jumps up, thrusting his javelin. After missing, he then throws it, but before it can hit the wall, Flash webs onto it and swings it back around, stabbing Craven. Craven screams out, causing the bats to wake up, and as they screech, the symbiote screams, separating itself from Flash. Craven gets up, ready to kill Flash Thompson, but then the bats swoop down, grabbing the both of them and carrying them out of the cave. Just as they get out, Flash takes up the gun that he has only one bullet left in, and he fires it into the bat's neck. The bat releases them, and Flash grabs onto a vine, and he pulls himself back to the foot of the cave. 
This is it. He's going to go back home and tell Betty everything. No more secrets from her. As long as he has her, nothing else can matter. And then he sees the symbiote crawling towards him. As it begins to bond back with him, he can hear a voice. One stating how it needs him, just as much as he needs it. There's no time for questions, though. He has a mission, and he needs to stop the Antarctic Vibranium from shipping out of here. Elsewhere, though, someone watched the whole thing. And saw Flash outside of his symbiote suit. A little while later, over in Brooklyn, Betty begins to hear a voice at the foot of her bed, and then someone lighting a match. Jack appears before her and asks, how does she love that legless drunk anyway? Back in the Savage Land, Flash makes his way down into the Vibranium Mines, killing all of the henchmen in his way. His fight with Craven cost him days, and now the Vibranium shipment is getting ready to leave. Slowly, the symbiote is gaining more and more control over him. Once the last henchman falls, Flash gives himself a sedative to try and relax the symbiote, but it will only give him about an hour, so he needs to hurry. Top side of the mine, the henchmen begin to prepare to take off with the Vibranium, and Flash runs in, charging through all of the men. But before jumping off the ledge, Flash leaves behind a bomb and he shoots his web. He needs his Hail Mary play. Will he make it? The web grabs a hold of the helicopter's tire, and Flash pulls himself up, and as he opens the door, the pilot tries shooting him, but then is quickly thrown out. Just as Flash jumps into the pilot seat, a voice over the radio begins to come in, telling him thank god he managed to get his shipment under control. But since he destroyed his mining operation, using his clearance in the army, he's going to deliver that chopper to New York. Flash asks if he really thinks he's just going to bring him the vibranium, and the man tells him, yes, I would want to deliver it too, you know, if I didn't want to see my girlfriend blown up. Back in Brooklyn, Peter Parker goes to visit Betty and realizes that something is wrong in Betty's apartment. Something very bad. And over in Bushwick, New York, Crime Master tells Flash Thompson one hell of a job. Really got us out of a pickle. But just like I promised, Betty is in a warehouse by the river. End of Valentine Lane. You have about five minutes. So you might not want to call your superiors or that bomb will go off a little early. Flash leaves, swinging through the city, but the symbiote slowly begins to take more control of him. He's had it too long, but that doesn't matter right now. All Flash knows is that he needs to get to Betty. He can't let anything stop him. And then Spider-Man appears, kicking Venom down. Flash tries to tell him to wait, but Spider-Man punches him and sends him flying into the ground. And then Spider-Man lands, telling everyone, you need to run. And through the dust, Venom webs up Spider-Man, pulling him in and hitting him with a massive punch. Flash's mind tells Venom to stop, but Venom continues flinging and beating down on Spider-Man. The more Flash tries to talk to the symbiote, the more he realizes there's no response. Response. The symbiote is blinded by rage, and then a Venom screams out, KILL SPIDER-MAN! Back in Bushwick, Crime Master's henchmen begin unloading the helicopter, and that's when one of them notices something laying inside. He shows Crime Master who looks at it, and then he pushes the man off the building. Seconds later, an explosion goes off. Over at the Project Rebirth facility, General Dodge says someone please correct him if he's wrong. But pushing that kill switch was supposed to blow up Venom, right? Catherine mentions, well, a bomb did go off, but it was over in Bushwick. Back in Brooklyn, the fight between Venom and Spider-Man rages on, but not long into it, Spider-Man begins beating Venom down, shouting, WHERE IS SHE?! Flash manages to mutter out, BOOM! And Spider-Man goes back to punching him, shouting, WHAT DID YOU DO WITH HER?! Flash tries to back away and escape, but Spider-Man webs up his leg and slams him back into the ground. He then jumps into attack, but as he gets close, Venom turns back and cracks him across the face! The punch sends Spider-Man flying through a store, and Venom charges in, reaching out. But instead of grabbing Spider-Man, he grabs the sedatives next to him and starts downing hundreds of pills. Venom slowly stumbles away and says, Warehouse, Valentine Lane. Spider-Man tries to figure out if he can trust him, but then Venom lifts a truck up and throws it. Flash tells Venom that he needs to stop, and if he doesn't, Betty is going to die. If he stays, Dodge will kill him. Does he want another host? Venom stops and thinks about it, and decides he doesn't want another host. So he'll allow Flash to take back over. Flash rushes over to the warehouse, and just as he gets to it, it explodes. Everything is gone. Everything good in his life. Betty. He's not a hero, he's a villain. And then he sees Spider-Man escaping at the last second with Betty. Flash manages to say thank you, but Spider-Man tells him no. You're a deranged sicko. I'll find you again, and next time, you won't be thanking me. As the symbiote begins to pull back, Flash notices that during the fight, Spider-Man managed to place a tracker on him. So for now, he'll keep it. There will probably be a time when he needs Spider-Man to find him. Flash radios to Catherine that the Vibranium shipment is in New York, and he's en route to stop it. Currently, he's still in control of the suit. As Flash swings through, a little robot devils flutter around stating how they love his costume, and then they begin to breathe fire all over him. Flash manages to fight some of them off, but then Jack O'Lantern flies back in, punching Flash off of the building. 
Jack tells him that he's kind of new at this. He's never really had a nemesis before, so he's gonna chain him up for now. He then starts flying through the buildings, dragging Flash along, and just before he can kill him, Crime Master radios in. He says that Vibranium is being intercepted by the government, the shipment he was supposed to guard. Jack takes off, stating that they'll have to continue this later, but he'll be seeing him around, Eugene. But before leaving, Flash managed to attack the locator the Spider-Man left on him, stating that he'll be seeing someone soon. A little while later, Flash, Betty, and Peter all sit in Betty's apartment after finally getting a chance to go home. Everyone begins to wonder why was it that Betty was targeted. She mentions that it might have been because of the recent crime story that she put out and they just got upset. Peter says that it may have just been the monster trying to lure out Spider-Man, but Flash says maybe Spider-Man is just getting in the middle of something, like he's a trouble magnet. But before the argument of whether Spider-Man is good or bad for everyone, Betty says that maybe it's just all brought on by Betty Brant's crack journalism. They're just gonna have to wait and see what happens next. As Betty leaves, Flash and Peter sit on the couch. Peter says, maybe she's just unlucky. Ended up in the middle of something bad. And Flash tells him, yeah, that much is clear. Things in New York have gotten weird recently. People are gaining spider powers from a bizarre infection going around New York City. Right now, it's kind of contained. A bank robber that's strong enough to break out a webbing, a police officer that's able to take him out with a single punch, and maybe a wannabe vigilante. But this is all a part of the latest plan from the Jackal. One of Spider-Man's worst villains, the man that is capable of cloning Peter Parker and is currently trying to see how far he can spread this disease, causing mild panic in the hospitals as people are coming in reporting sticky fingers and odd feelings. Peter Parker, aka Spider-Man himself, is off training with Madame Webb, but more worried about his lack of spider sense. You see, Horizon Labs, the company that Peter Parker works for, accidentally created a device that jams Spider-Man's spider sense, and in response, he's been learning Kung Fu and how to properly fight from Shang Tsi and Madame Webb herself. He calls it Spider-Fu. While Peter Parker is going back to his apartment because his girlfriend Carly Cooper wants to chat about something that she discovered, Jackal is moving forward with the next part of his plan. The revival of the first Peter Parker clone, the misfit, the reject, Kane. He's looking a little bit more like a spider though, and less like Peter Parker now. Over at Peter Parker's apartment, Carly shares an amazing secret with him. Somehow, She's got the spider powers. She tells Peter this while standing on the ceiling of his apartment. Peter's in shock. So you got spider powers and you just come out and tell me? And just like that, she makes Peter feel like crap. Well, yeah, we're a couple and this is what couples do. Who else am I gonna share this with? Uh, thanks, I guess. So after showing off her strength, she asks Peter that since he makes tech for Spider-Man, can he maybe make her some spider tech? Maybe he could even set her up with Spider-Man so that she could possibly become his sidekick. Um, can we just do something normal? I need to go drop Aunt May off at the airport. Oh, that's lame. I should go on patrol or something. That'd be awesome. Meanwhile, Jackal is putting the next phase of his plan into action. He goes to a local gang with his two enforcers, the Spider King and Tarantula. He hands the gang a box filled with Spider-Man uniforms, and he tells them that it's their lucky day. He then sets a bunch of criminals with spider powers loose on New York, all dressed up as Spider-Man. Mary Jane looks around at dozens of Spider-Men swinging around causing problems, and she says to herself that if we're doing the clone thing again, I swear I'm going back to LA. She then jumps underneath a car saving a kid as various superheroes arrive, and Hawkeye shouts, everyone assemble! Over at the George Washington Bridge, after dropping Aunt May and her husband off at the airport, Peter and Carly find themselves in a traffic gridlock when the radio host starts reporting about Spider-Man going crazy all over the town. Carly tells Peter sorry, she's a cop, and she gets on the roof and then using her organic webbing, she's out of there. But as she leaves, she decides to tell Peter that this looks like a job for your friendly neighborhood, Spider Cop. Peter then gets out of the car, so that's what that feels like. And then he sneaks off and changes and joins her as Spider-Man. Well, the real one. Meanwhile, back at Ground Zero with the Spider-Man attack, the Avengers and everyone else are shocked because every single one of these Spider-Men are as strong as Spider-Man himself. At least they aren't cracking the webhead's lame jokes, Hawkeye says, dropping another one of the black-suited Spider-Men. Speak for yourself, Hawkeye. That'd give me a bigger reason to pound them, Luke Cage says, preparing to punch another armored Spider-Man. But at that exact moment, Spider-Man, the real one, Peter Parker, comes swinging in and he sees Miss Marvel. Hey, Miss Marvel, I'm looking for a girl. And she knocks him on the ground. Great, now they're all getting pervy, she tells the rest of the superheroes. Peter gets back up and he tries to explain. I'm the real Spider-Man. But the thing turns back to him. Yeah, like I haven't heard that five times already. And he clobbers Spider-Man. Then Iron Fist comes in with a fully charged Iron Fist. So Shang Tsi jumps in to save the day. He was watching the whole thing unfold with Madame Web, and Madame Web can see into the future, and she saw this coming. But he refuses to stand by while Peter is getting beaten on by his friends. 
Hawkeye snaps at Shang. What are you doing? That's one of the bad guys. But a Wolverine confirms it. Yeah, that one smells like ours. Plus, he ate a cherry Pop-Tart. Peter rubs his head telling Wolverine, Shh, I didn't bring enough for everyone. But everyone tells Peter that he has to get out of this fight. If he's here, everyone will be holding back just in case they might punch him. So sadly, Peter leaves and he changes back into his civilian clothes. He then runs over to Mary Jane and a reporter friend of his. But that gives him an idea. If Spider-Man can't join the fight, why couldn't Peter Parker? So he hands the camera to Mary Jane and he tells her to point it right at him. Keep him on frame. Hey, if you're watching this, then you know what's going on. Some New Yorkers woke up today with spider powers and now they're tearing our city apart. And all over the world, everyone's asking, why would they do that? Because everyone knows us as loud, rude, obnoxious jerks. Well, guess what? This morning, I woke up with spider powers just like the rest of you. And I'm gonna do my part. My name's Peter Parker and I'm a native New Yorker. And when I look around, I don't see a bunch of jerks. I see teachers, nurses, cops, parents, neighbors, and friends. Good people who give their all every day. I see heroes. And today, we're not just heroes, we're superheroes. So Peter Parker then swings back in with a bunch of regular people that got spider powers, ready to save the day. And they begin beating on the spider-powered villains and Carly notices her boyfriend Peter is in the fray. But once all of the villains are nabbed up, things go into full swing. The spider flu is a disease that Reed Richards needs to cure. So they lock down New York and they quarantine it. No one gets in or out. And Peter then reports to Horizon Labs while spider cop Carly gets to work trying to prevent the regular citizens from becoming superheroes. Reed takes Peter aside because he knows that Peter is really Spider-Man and he takes his blood. The only thing that they know at first is that superpowered individuals aren't affected. It's only affecting normal people. But while they're searching for a cure, something else interesting is going on. Eddie Brock, now known as Anti-Venom, is running around trying to cure people of the spider flu. His symbiote can do it, and he's just crazy enough to think that he can be New York's savior. While Flash Thompson, aka Agent Venom, is also secretly jumping into New York to assist with this problem as a Black Ops operative. Back with Peter Parker, he has now joined Carly in her investigation because Reed got what he needed, and she decided that this whole thing sounds like something that an old Spider-Man villain, the Jackal, would do. So they swing themselves to the last known hideout of the Jackal to see what clues they could find out. But while they're tracking down the Jackal, Agent Venom has run into a bit of a problem on the nearby bridge as he's battling against King Spider, one of the Jackal's enforcers. He manages to use one of the local superheroes as a weapon by throwing him into the air and having him land on King Spider, knocking him unconscious. And then he hauls him off to his Black Ops unit to figure out who King Spider is. While the entire situation is a mess because King Spider broke free, Flash Thompson was able to get his Venom symbiote back and he's about to kill King Spider. And that's when everyone discovers that King Spider is actually a transformed Steve Rogers. He's actually Captain America. So they subdue him and Agent Venom uses his symbiote to change his appearance into King Spider, allowing him to go undercover into Jackal's organization. Meanwhile, back with Peter Parker and Carly, they've entered Jackal's lair only to find White Rabbit, Chance, and Scorcher waiting. Carly tells Peter that this is perfect. If the bad guys are here, that must mean Jackal's involved. They both leap into the air, dodging the flames coming from the Scorcher, and Peter throws out a web barrage, and Carly starts trying to fight against the White Rabbit, only to take a hit to her head. Seeing his girlfriend in trouble, Peter jumps onto White Rabbit using a spider food. And this confuses Carly, because if he had these crazy moves, why didn't he use them earlier? But that was all it took to wrap up the villains and haul them off. But before she goes, Carly tells Peter that she needs to talk to Spider-Man and him together. Figure out a way to get them both into the same location, because she needs to see them. Meanwhile, Anti-Venom is trying his best to cure everyone near him. But the civilians of New York don't want to be cured. They consider Eddie Brock's Anti-Venom a monster trying to take away their awesome powers. And he keeps trying to tell them that he is their savior! But all of these spider-powered individuals popping up is also causing issues for Madam Web because she's now becoming overwhelmed with the amount of spider-powered people joining the web of life. It's overwhelming! She doesn't know what's causing it! Back with Spider-Man and Carly, he explains that she just missed Peter. And that's when they get a call to go stop Shocker because he's breaking into a bank during this whole thing. As odd as that is. When they get there right off, Spider-Man can tell that something is wrong because the Shocker now has six arms. I need this money! I don't want to be a stupid freak, he shouts out as he begins throwing his beams all over the place. They said they could fix me if I got this money! Wait, Shocker, are you serious? Spider-Man says, dodging everything, and that's when the Shocker pulls off his mask to reveal the monster that he is changing into. Matters get even worse though as Carly begins changing into a full-on spider monster behind Peter Parker. And then the web of life goes to its extreme as people begin changing all over New York. Spider-Man looks in horror as everyone around him begins changing into these giant spider monsters and they all begin to crawl away. 
He then hits his knees, feeling defeated because he lost track of Spider Carly. All of these spider monsters are going to one central location in Central Park. To the Spider Queen! It turns out that Jackal isn't the evil mastermind behind this plot. The Spider Queen is actually a woman named Adrian Soria, a woman with a history tied into Captain America and Spider-Man. She originally defeated them and then went into hiding until Captain America found her as she was starting her plans with the Jackal. So she defeated him with her new superpowers and had him changed. At that moment, Agent Venom, disguised as King Spider, arrives at the location. He kneels before the Queen and they accept him. The plan worked. Meanwhile, back with Anti-Venom, he's retreated into a church where there are now mutated spider people that have changed their tune and they're begging for him to cure them. He decides to take his role as the savior to heart. He'll cure them all! Back at Horizon, Mayor Jonah Jameson has decided that he has his own plan and he demands that his bodyguards take him to the emergency command center. Of course, this is a terrible idea as his convoy is quickly under attack from the giant spider monsters and Spider-Man has to swing in to save the day. But Jameson refuses to be saved by Spider-Man again and he gets out of his car using his own spider powers to start fighting against the monsters with Spider-Man. J. Jonah Jameson, the sensational Spider-Man, too many quips, my brain is overloading, Spider-Man says. Not another word, Jameson says, joining him in the fight. Meanwhile, back with the Spider Queen, she now gets news that there is someone named Eddie Brock, otherwise known as Anti-Venom, out curing the Spider Flu. So she decides to send the Spider King off to kill Anti-Venom, not realizing that she actually just sent Agent Venom off. Over at the command center, Spider-Man and Jameson arrive, and Spider-Man sees Jameson's plan to use Alistair Smythe, the Spider Slayer, against the Spider Monsters. With everyone telling him that he's insane, Jameson walks over to Smythe. How do I stop a whole city of spiders? But since Jameson has displayed spider powers, he is also connected to the web. The same web that the Spider Queen is using to manipulate the spider monsters. And she makes Jameson remember his own wife being killed by Smythe. Jameson begins to change and morph into the giant spider monsters. And he lunges at Alistair, biting him on the neck and killing him. Meanwhile, across the town at the church, Agent Venom has arrived to get Eddie Brock. But Brock recognizes the Venom symbiote and he begins to freak out. He tells Agent Venom that Venom is a leech and it'll change its owner like it did to him. But Agent Venom tells him that he's not a mass murderer. So Anti-Venom throws Agent Venom out of the church and he tries to cure him, wiping out the symbiote to finally get his revenge against it. But Agent Venom manages to kick Anti-Venom off of him and the two duke it out even more, with Flash Thompson slowly losing control of his symbiote. Venom is mad and Flash can't keep it in check. Once Anti-Venom gets Agent Venom back onto the ground, he starts to get ready to cure it again. And Flash freaks out, throwing the whole symbiote onto Anti-Venom. Now without having any control over it, it starts to try and take control of Eddie, and it begins to try and get rid of his anti-venom so it can go home, where it belongs. It wants to become the true venom again! But Flash begs it, come back, return to me, I need you! The symbiote considers it, and it leaves Eddie Brock for Flash Thompson again, leaving Eddie unconscious. Agent Venom picks him up and he drops him off with Reed Richards back at Horizon Labs, where Eddie willingly gives up his anti-venom symbiote for Reed to use even if it'll turn Eddie back to normal again. He'll be the savior! All Agent Venom had to do was ask. Back with Mary Jane, she's finally gotten spider powers after everyone else around her has already completely changed. And using them, she's trying to save people and become a spider-powered individual. It's time for Spider Jane, people! And then back over at the Emergency Command Center, Spider-Man is fighting against a super-powered Jameson trying to kill everyone. Luckily, he was able to knock him out and web him up. He then runs over to Alistair. We could save you! But Alistair knows that he's done, and he tells Spider-Man that he already has the answer. The Spider Slayers. Meanwhile, Reed has used the Anti-Venom symbiote to come up with a cure, and he injects it into one of Peter's co-workers to check if it works. And it does, but the moment that he changes her back, the Queen knows, because she can feel Reed severing people from the Great Web. Realizing that them having a cure isn't good for their plans, Jackal suggests that they send their other enforcer to destroy the cure. Send in the monstrous Kane! Back at Horizon Labs, Madam Web has figured out why she can't see the future. It's not just the fact that there are so many spiders, it's the fact that this problem is combined with the spider jammers. Together, there are too many visions and she can't find a correct path to the future. She teleports into Horizon Labs into a ball of fire, and she tells the fools there to turn off their jammers. Not only does it block Spider-Man, but it also disrupts her visions. Fix it now! Spider-Man, on the other hand, is returning to his lab to see if he can figure out what Alistair is talking about. And he slips in like he always does, but he does find it odd that the computer is already reading him inside. He drops into the lab, and Kane jumps on him! Kane begins to swing at Spider-Man as Spider-Man tries to convince him to stop! Kane is just doing the Jackal's bidding again! He's better than this! 
but Kane can't hear him. He just hears the Jackal's orders and he swings at Spider-Man again. So Spider-Man goes to plan B and he starts using his Spider-Foo on Kane. But Kane isn't even affected and he throws Spider-Man to the ground. See your moves, got them on tape. With Spider-Man on the ground, Kane runs over to the doors and using his Parker DNA, he gets inside where the cure is being manufactured off of the anti-venom symbiote. If he can destroy this, they won't be able to make another cure. Kane creates a toxin that the Jackal orders him to do and he throws it into the vat of the cure. But before it can hit the vat, Spider-Man uses his webs and he catches it. Kane replies by getting his webbing onto Spider-Man's face and yanking him towards himself. And then he holds him over the vat of the cure, ready to shove him in with the toxin and cure Spider-Man and contaminate the rest of it once and for all. Right then, at that exact moment, the scientists of Horizon Labs deactivate their spider jammers. It's back! Spider-Man has his spider sense again, and it's stronger than ever. He dodges the punch, jumps into the air, and cracks Kane on the back of the head, throwing him into the cure. Kane then crawls out of the vat of cure. Uh, little help over here? Spider-Man runs over. Kane! And Kane explains everything. The queen is behind this, that Jackal is working for her, and that they need to stop her. While over with the queen and the Jackal, she slams him with a sonic blast for failing her again. And Madam Web realizes the mistake that she's made, because the queen is now getting all of the power from her spider underlings. Meanwhile, back with Agent Venom, he's decided to infiltrate her base, and once she catches him, she kicks his butt across the floor until they both end up in Central Park, where a now-cured Captain America jumps in to join the fight. With their efforts combined, they drop the Queen and finally succeed in ending this. Or so we'd hope, because the Queen begins to get all of the power from her spiders, and she changes in to the giant Spider Queen, the true Queen of the Spiders. Captain America turns to Agent Venom. Soldier, are you with me? Always. All right, round two. Across town, back at Spider-Man's lab, Kane and Spider-Man come up with a plan. Why not have two Spider-Men? So he gives them one of his older suits and they get ready to tag team this adventure. Over in what was once Central Park, the Spider-Queen is rampaging with Agent Venom and Cap on a helicopter in front of her and the rest of the superheroes trying to figure out what the heck they should do. Kane and Spider-Man land a safe distance away trying to think of what they should do and that's when Madam Web appears. She's feeding off of the strength from all of her subjects, an entire island. She's a god now, Peter. The only way you can stop her is by killing her. Peter and Kane then jump off the roof together. You know that's not my way, Madam Web. Parker Brothers, away! That is not our catchphrase. We'll get sued, Kane says, ready to be the hero again. Spider-Man swings in with a solid punch at the Queen's head, and she throws him back against a building. But he gets caught by Mary Jane swinging by. Figured I owed you a few, Tiger. I don't know how to fight this one, MJ. Build something! That's your speech? Build something? Do you see the size of her? We would need a million spider slayers to... I have an idea! With that, Spider-Man and MJ leave the superheroes and came to fight against the Spider Queen. He takes off to the police precinct where all of his old villain's gear is located. And he goes to the safe where they're keeping Doc Ock's Octobots. Then, they go to the largest antenna in Manhattan. Using it, he controls all of the Doc Ock Octobots. Every single one of the millions of them out there and he gets them to Horizon Labs, where he grabs up all of Reed Richards' cure. Then, using the bots, he sticks every single one of the spider monsters with the cure to turn them back into regular people. The loss of so many spider people begins to depower the queen. I'm gonna save everyone, MJ, Peter says with a grin. Back over at the queen, she begins to lose her power, but she isn't done yet. So Miss Marvel turns to Kane. Me and Spuddy have a move. You think you can do it? If you can do it, I can do it. So she grabs one of his webs and she spins him around throwing Kane. He then crosses the line that Peter Parker never could. He pulls out his spider fangs that are in his wrists and he launches right through the Queen's head killing her. And the superheroes win again. The Queen is dead. All of the humans turn back into humans and everyone laughs at how they're naked now. Eddie Brock is considered a hero to all of New York after saving everyone. And Reed gets credit for saving the city with Eddie's help. Kane decides that he needs to move on. Now that he's alive again, there isn't room for another spider person in New York. So he'll head off for a little while. Maybe somewhere down south, like Houston. Carly Cooper figured it all out. She figured out that Spider-Man is Peter Parker. He was too good with the powers and he adapted too quickly. She's a cop after all, and the fact that he didn't tell her is a break of trust that she can't live with. So she left him. While everything seems to be going rocky for Spider-Man, as it always does because he lost Carly and he lost Kane, Mary Jane has him open his eyes for one second. The New Yorkers themselves I found a way to honor their hero.
the end of the Spider Island events, Flash Thompson is faced with reading the letter that his father passed away. Still bruised from the last fight, he sits with his mother and Betty at his father's services, but behind the priest, he sees him. Jack O' Lantern. As services come to a close, friends and family all say their goodbyes, and Jack goes to Flash to give him his condolences. Jack introduces himself to Betty, telling her that Flash here saved his life back in Mosul, which is why he's so pretty now. Flash also sponsors him in an Alcoholics Anonymous group, which is why he's here. He knows it's probably a bad time, and he could probably use a friend to talk to. At first, Flash tells him, now isn't a good time. But Betty says it's alright. He sounds like he really needs him. And Jack tells her, it would mean the world to me. Who knows, he might just be saving a life. A little while later, Jack takes Flash to Crime Master's hideout, where Crime Master tells him that he has his condolences, buddy. But to get to the point, I need your alter ego to get a little work done. Flash asks him, if I do this, will you leave me alone? And Crime Master tells him, oh god no, probably not. For those of you who don't know, Flash Thompson, aka Agent Venom, is currently being blackmailed to work with Crime Master and Jack O' Lantern. The deal here isn't what you've given us, Flash. It's about what you get to keep. Your mother, Betty, I'll allow them to keep on living if you work for me. So I'm gonna need you to go ahead and head out towards Las Vegas. Your suit will know what it needs to do when it gets there. Flash knows that he could kill him, twist his head off right now. But the goons would gun him down and then Jack would kill Betty. Though now isn't the right time, soon he will kill them as Venom. Kill every last one of them. The next day at the Project Rebirth facility, the military organization keeping track of the Venom situation, General Dodge receives a visit from Captain America, who's here to shut down his Project Rebirth. Though if it wasn't for Venom, the world would be plagued with spiders in the Spider Island event. But because the Venom symbiote is such a dangerous tool, it is to come back with him to the new Avengers station for containment. When Captain America then asks where it is so he can take it, he's told that, sadly enough, the operative's identity is confidential, along with any file that contains his identity being deleted. Worse yet, Agent Venom is already long gone. Outside of the snow, Flash thinks that there is still time. He can turn around and take the suit back. But if he does, he wouldn't be able to protect his family. Since Crime Master found out his identity, he could just kill Betty. Without the suit, he's just nothing. So Flash begins to scale down the mountain, and that's when he hears Captain America telling him this could end one of two ways, and he would prefer the easy route. Flash tells him that he needs the symbiote right now. Lives are on the line. You're gonna have to trust me on this one, Captain. And Captain America tells him, it's a rotten alien I don't trust. Just as Captain gets ready to throw his shield, Flash launches himself at Captain America. Cap catches the kick, and once Flash jumps away, throws his shield, hitting him in the back of the head. The two of them struggle on the ground, and Flash webs up Cap's face and punches him. The hit was so hard that it knocked Cap over the cliff. Flash Flash quickly swings down catching him, and after setting him back down on the ground, he swings away. Shortly after, Cap goes back to report that Agent Venom fled, and what's worse, he took my bike. Days later, Flash Thompson heads back home to make sure that everything is alright with Betty and his mother, and as he hangs up the phone, he knows that Betty isn't going to put up with his lies much longer. As he heads back to his hotel room, he plans how he's going to kill Crime Master, but just as he opens the door, he sees Jack laying on his bed. The Venom suit quickly covers Flash, and Jack tells him, relax, I'm not here to kill you. I'm just here to help you. We're gonna be road trip buddies. Flash tells him that that wasn't the deal, but Jack says that's the funny thing about being blackmailed. The deal is what we say it is, and I know what we're supposed to collect. Jack offers Flash a drink and he tells him no. So Jack says, your father was a drinker too, right? Flash grabs him and Venom takes over telling him, never mention my family again. Jack tells him, temper temper, you're losing control. We wouldn't want that thing in the driver's seat. It'll be bad for business. The next morning, the two of them head out for Vegas, but along the way, a news report comes on the radio about a cave at the Douglas Mine and Elko trapping several men. Flash stomps on the brakes and spins the car around, and Jack asks him, just what the hell are you doing? Flash tells him that they just passed Elko. They're gonna go help those men. Over at the mine, some of the workers gathered around as one of the men was impaled and is currently under a few large boulders. The workers try to tell the man to hang on. They're gonna go get some help, but moments later, everyone begins to hear rumbling. They all look up and they see Venom pulling back some of the rocks and telling them that he's not really an expert, but this roof seems a bit faulty. As he holds the roof back from caving in, Jack tells everyone to hurry up and run, and one of the workers tells him that they can't leave their friend behind. Jack tells him, here's the thing, my friend won't leave until everyone's out, and seeing as this one's kind of stuck, blam. Jack shoots the man, and then he tells Flash, you're right about this superhero thing, it feels terrific. After the incident, Flash and Jack stop by a local diner to get some food. As the waitress walks up, she sees Jack and is startled, and Jack says that he's got a real trash mess for a face, doesn't he? The waitress tries to tell him that that, that that isn't it. But as the cook comes out to ask what the problem is, Jack tells him, judging by the food you cook, I might pass on getting something. 
Flash tells him to forgive his friend. He's got some brain damage. He's a poster child for PTSD. Jack says, yeah, I've had a real rough childhood. I was snatched up as a kid by Crime Master and raised to be his son. Raised and trained to be an assassin. And eventually, I went home to my real parents and killed them and discovered that my particular signature of hollowing out heads and lighting candles in them. Jack then gets up to go use the bathroom and Flash thinks that he should just return the suit. No more lies, except he needs it. Jack then comes back out stating that they need to hit the road. He already took care of the check. As they get outside, Flash asks if he left the poor woman a tip, and Jack asks him, what, am I some kind of an ass? Don't worry, I took real good care of them. Later, the two reach Vegas, and Flash enters the casino shouting and creating a scene, spilling his drinks, throwing dice on the workers, so much so that the security has to drag him off. Once alone, the guards tell Flash that he picked the wrong casino to pull that crap in, and then Flash jumps around knocking the two men out. Something here is upsetting the symbiote. Whatever crime master is having him come get, Venom doesn't like it. Flash heads to the elevator and begins to head farther in, but the more Flash thinks about his family in danger, the more he begins to lose control, until Venom finally takes over. As the elevator doors bust open, Venom leaps out, throwing all of the security guards to the side. He leaps and he blasts through the security vault, smelling something. It's here, and they must kill it. They must kill the competition for what is coming. Toxin must die! Jack tries to radio in, telling Venom to control himself, but Venom grabs the Toxin symbiote, tearing it apart! Jack crashes through the window shouting, What are you doing? You realize that you just breached our contract, right? After blasting him away, Jack begins to put the symbiote into a canister, and Venom leaps back in, stating that we have to kill it! He knocks the two of them out of the building, and Jack grabs his broom to stop the fall. Crime Master radios back, asking Jack if he has the symbiote, and Jack tells him, Yeah, what should I do now? And Crime Master tells him, You should run. Venom begins chasing Jack through the city, and he jumps on his back, causing him to crash into an electric billboard. Jack tries to get back up, but Venom just stomps on him. He gets up ready to swing, but Jack tells him, wait, you need to get this under control or my dad will kill your mom. He's totally a super bad guy. He would really do it. Slowly, Venom begins to shrink smaller and smaller until Flash is back in control. Jack tells him, that's good. I know you weren't in full control. So now I will leave your family alone so long as Venom leaves my family alone, all right? Do yourself a favor and get a drink. Later, after Jack leaves with a canister that contains toxin, Flash makes a call all the way back to Benny. He tells her that he can't go on like this. He can't keep up with her needs and his job. She's been great, but they're through. He then heads to the liquor store, buys a bottle, and sits down next to a bum in the alley. The bum watches as Flash drinks most of the bottle in one sip and he asks him, hard times? Flash hands in the bottle, and as the Venom shadow appears behind him, he tells him, we're getting used to it. Our story begins in Las Vegas, as Flash Thompson sits in a hotel telling Betty to stop calling him. They're finally through. After throwing down the phone, Flash tells himself that this is good. He just needs to keep her away from him, and then he turns back to the half-drank liquor bottle. Meanwhile, over at the Devil's Den Casino, Laura Kinney receives a tip that someone has made a purchase of her blood. The casino's owner, Mr. Degley, has been planning on stealing something that many have attempted to do before, and that is steal her soul. However, elsewhere, Degley and his assistant, Oily, make their way to the construction site. The site is guarding a giant pentagram. Oily says that it's time for them to get the party started, and then her and Degley begin their preparations. First, 100 human souls, alien flesh provided by Toxin, and the blood of a mortal who's been to hell and back. The skies begin to turn red, and Degley says now they must await their final ingredient. Just outside of Vegas, the new Ghost Rider, Alejandra, and the former Ghost Rider, Johnny Blaze, sit in a cafe getting a bite to eat. As they get their food, Alejandra starts to hear them, hundreds of cursed, sinful souls screaming out. Johnny says that that's a pretty big number. They should call a friend of his to investigate. However, as Johnny runs outside to a payphone, Alejandra has already left him behind. Back in the hotel, Flash looks at a picture of his father, thinking about how there were never really any good times, and how now he's following in his father's footsteps with the drinking. Suddenly, there's a loud BOOM! And Thunderbolt Ross comes charging into the room, telling Flash, housekeeping. Ross says that he's going to hand over the symbiote now, but without Flash the bond with, Venom starts to cover Ross. He runs back out of the room, trying to pull the symbiote off of him, and just as Venom releases, Ross sees Venom caused him to run into a gas station, which then explodes. 
out on the strip, Flash runs away thinking that there's no way that he can handle a Hulk right now. He needs to get away. And then from the blast at the gas station, Ross jumps down and he smiles at Flash. And he tells him, Hulk smash! Moments later, Flash is launched and shot across the city. And then over at the construction site, Alejandra makes her way closer and can hear the screaming getting louder and louder. She realizes that this device is a black doorway. Something that can literally bring hell onto Earth. After jumping down, Alejandra begins to ride in the opposite direction that the device is spinning. All the while, Degley is watching and smiling. Soon, the force from Alejandra's riding begins to open up the portal, and Degley calls out to her, stating that he could never have done this with any other soul. But she's just powered the centrifuge and opened the door to hell. But she should think twice about stopping, because if she does, the doorway will reverse and pull down everything into hell. During this, Flash and Ross continue to battle, but as Ross is knocked to the ground, he sees the ground is kind of on fire. He asks if this is one of Flash's powers, and Flash tells him, no, I actually thought it was one of yours. Both of them turn back, and they start to see demons bursting out of the ground, and they begin to chase all of the humans, and Flash says, hell is exactly what this is. Flash quickly tries to jump in to stop one of the demons, but another gets by, and Ross gets ready with a school bus to smack it down. But back outside of the city limits, Johnny pulls up to see the fire, slowly thinking to himself that he knows what this means. Someone is making a play at the convergence. So after pulling out an amulet and placing it on the Las Vegas sign, he says that this will make a barrier that the Hellfire cannot pass. So it's time for him to step in and fix this. As Degley and Oily ride through the burning city on their chariot, Degley says that Hell's expansion seems to have been halted. Once they get back to Degley's, Oily says that it's been a long time since they've seen home, since his father cast them out. Degley's voice then begins to change and he says, And now, all of a sudden, Hell bows to Blackheart. Degley changes back into his original form, Blackheart, and Oily changes back into a demon. She tells him that if she had to disguise herself any longer, she would claw her own eyes out. But at least they did have uses for their flesh. After the two of them kiss, Blackheart turns to an orb and says that now it's time for them to gloat. The orb begins to display an image of Mephesto, and Blackheart asks, how is his corner of hell tonight? Mephesto tells him that it's secure, though he can see that that was not a part of his plan to leave it as such. Mephesto laughs, stating, You could have uprooted all of hell, but you only managed to draw in a small, meaningless corner. Surely you didn't think to call and brag about that failure. Blackheart tells him that soon the souls of hell and earth will be his, and soon he will have more power than Mephesto, and he will torment him for eternity. Blackheart then tells Oily to bring him their symbiote warriors, and she tells them that there's a bit of a problem with that. Somebody's already gone and released them. The orb then displays images of Laura already engaged fighting the symbiotes that were created from her blood. Back outside of the centrifuge, Johnny makes his way out to Alejandra, and he tells her that he'll take over for now. She needs to hurry and find whoever is casting the spell. She says that the spirits will tear him apart, but he tells her that he's made of some pretty stern stuff. He could survive for a while. Now go. Soon inside Blackheart's office, a loud crash comes out of the window as Laura jumps in asking if he's the pig who stole her blood. And then Flash and Ross burst in from the door asking if he's the one responsible for this. Blackheart looks at them and says, I am guilty of all charges. Moments later through the other window, Alejandra storms in and Blackheart tells everyone, you are all weak. Now the Hellion's Mirror Cauldron will steal the impression of your soul's true form and twist it. The four heroes stand as their four counterparts make their way out of the mirror. Blackheart tells Oily to go find out what's stopping the expansion, and just as she leaves, all of the counterparts begin attacking. Ross calls out to Alejandra and tells her to follow the butt ugly one with wings, and whatever she needs to do, stop her. As Flash stands before the evangelist, he tells him that he never really was big on church. Plus, he looks kind of weak. The priest begins to shout, Weakness? I'll show you weakness, just like how much you rely on that suit. Pages from the book that the priest is holding start to fly towards Flash, and they start ripping venom from him. The shadow starts to take form, and Flash sees his father, drinking, and the priest says that it's like father like son, following in the same footsteps as his father. He was crippled even before the war took his legs. Laura begins to look around, asking if this is hell, then how, and X666 finishes, stating, you're wondering how you can be in hell if you don't have a soul. X66 begins cheering, and Laura pushes her aside, stating, yeah, you're the blonde, pure, all-American cheerleader I could never be. Hell's gonna have to try a little bit better than that. X666 then stabs Laura in the back with her metal pom-pom, and tells her that she's exactly what she is on the surface, a cheap Wolverine knockoff. Back with Alejandra, Ikor slowly catches up to Alejandra and knocks her off her bike. He stands over her, telling her that he is the blood of the gods. He is pure retribution without their human frailties. As he cracks open the ground, a hole starts to open and Alejandra falls in. He goes on stating that her brand of vengeance isn't holy, it's just selfish mortal revenge. He then tells her that she has so much to pay for and Alejandra says, you're right. 
Alejandra was a bad girl, and you may hold power over her, but Alejandra is dead! Ghost Rider calls out. Alejandra's bike rides in, and then she starts to ride over Igor as Ghost Rider, telling him, Ghost Rider is all that's left! But as Alejandra has overcome her weakness, the others are still struggling, along with Johnny, who's trying to maintain the centrifuge. Back outside of the city limits, Stephen Strange and Damon Hellstorm look at the barrier around Vegas, and Damon says, Hell is coming. As Alejandra makes her way back, Blackheart taunts her, stating that once hell will spread, the spirit of vengeance will sit at my right hand. She tells him to get out of her head. Besides, she's about to snap his beloved's neck. Blackheart watches and tells her to wait, and then calls for all of the counterparts to move in on Alejandra's location. A little while later, Flash finds Ross sitting alone, and Ross says that, that brain matter thing knew and made him cry out for his mother. They will not talk about this to anyone. Flash then asks if he's got a plan, and before leaping away, he tells him, Soldier, I've always got a plan. Land. Back at Blackheart's tower, X666 tells Laura that she'll be back soon. She's needed elsewhere, but until then, keep on smiling! Still wounded from before, Laura pushes her way into Blackheart's chamber, and Blackheart's voice asks if she's here to kill him, so she tells him yes. He tells her that she's welcome to try, but he does have bodyguards, and she may recognize them, since they're all made from her. Over with Alejandra, she manages to pin oil down, but just before she can cut her head off, the rest of the counterparts appear to stop her. The priest tells Alejandra to just face it. She can't beat all of them. She belongs with them. God's spirit of vengeance she might be, but she carries a demon inside. X666 starts cheering, telling her, join us! I know an exciting sauna routine for the new members. Seconds later, Ross and Flash come crashing in, stating that they really don't care about routines. Ross then calls out for them to switch counterparts and for Alejandra to hurry back up and catch up to oil. The priest then asks Ross if he feels like his fists are stronger than hell, because if so, he's a fool. A blast shoots out of Ross's chest and everyone turns to see a giant gaping hole right through him. Alejandra Alejandra shouts that she will kill them, but the brain matter being opens Alejandra's chest, telling her that there is nothing. Venom starts to take over Flash, and he tells Alejandra to just go. He'll hold the line! And she tells him that they will kill him like they did Ross and her. Venom's voice starts to take over, telling her, So they'll kill me, but I'll hold the line! Meanwhile, over at the tower, Laura fights her way through the symbiote clones of herself, and after one last slice at one's head, she focuses her attention at Blackheart. Blackheart stops her for a moment and asks if she would like to know if the clones have souls, because he knows the answer. She stops and tells him, yes. And he says, you are suffering in hell right now. You couldn't be in hell without a soul, but that's the trouble with souls. Blackheart pushes a button stating, Souls make people stupid. And then the floor opens up beneath Laura's feet and she falls down into a pit of lava. Back outside, the priest begins to attack Flash using the pages of the Bible as he did before, but this time, Venom rushes forward grabbing the book and aiming it at the brain matter being. He then grabs the priest by the neck and begins to squeeze. The priest shouts, You can't kill me! And Flash tells him, You're not real. My mind created you, so I could damn well kill you. As the priest takes his last breath, hands reach out from behind Flash and then snap. Oily reports that she won't be able to catch the Ghost Rider in time for the amulet. But as Alejandra rides off, Blackheart whispers to her that he can put the souls back into people that she's wronged. So destroy the amulet, and she will put right those that she has wronged. Losing more and more of her strength, she begins to crawl towards the amulet, and Stephen Strange asks, what are you doing? She grabs the amulet and Damien shouts, No, don't do it! And then the amulet begins to burn. Ash slowly begins to fall and she says that she's sorry. And the fury skull fades. However, just as she grabs the amulet, everyone begins to see the lives that they wanted. Alejandra finally finds her mother. Flash sees that he has all of his limbs again and how Spider-Man offered him a place as Spider-Man. Ross leads a special group known as the Hulkbusters. And even Laura was saved at the last minute by Logan from the lava pit. But slowly, these visions begin to turn. They turn into twisted versions of them or their loved ones dying. Everyone begins to scream out and they realize that it was all in their head. A voice then calls out to everyone asking if they know where they are. And Flash says that they are fighting evil. Doesn't that give them a pass on this place. The voice says that they let the infertile border spread. They were already on the threshold, so there really is only one place they could have gone. Welcome to hell. Mephesto appears before everyone, telling them what really burns him, and pardon his expression, was that this new territory was broken into by Blackheart. Alejandra asks if he's competition, and Mephesto says he's the worst kind. He's my son. Mephesto then goes on stating that he can fix this, because technically, you shouldn't be able to die in hell. So all you need to do is agree to one condition of mine, and I will put you back on Earth to beat the snot out of that boy. Flash says, what do you need, our souls? And Mephesto tells him, actually, 
kind of already have them. You are in hell, but I will call on you at a later time. So all you need to do is enter into my eternal covenant. Mephesto holds out his hand, asking if he has their vows, and one by one, they all place their hand on his. A short while later, back up on Earth, the heroes return to the world of the living, and Alejandra tells everyone that things are getting worse. Blackheart is in possession of the spirit of vengeance. But before the group can move out, the demons start to crawl out of the ground. Laura jumps in, hacking away at everything that moves, and once the last one is done, everyone starts to set their new plan in motion. The plan will be for Laura to sneak over to the centrifuge and leave a bomb to blow up once Johnny spins the other direction while the others head back to the tower. While Laura quietly cleans the demons out there, Blackheart begins his preparations for bonding with the spirit of vengeance. And just as he does, a giant red hulk gets closer and closer and closer. Once he gets close enough, Ross punches through the window, knocking Blackheart to the ground. Ross jumps on top of him, but before he can continue beating on him, Spike shoot out of Ross's back. Before allowing him to do any major harm, Venom jumps in, punching and swinging. And while Flash and Ross battle, Alejandra sneaks in and grabs the spirit of vengeance. Flash tells her to give it to him and stick to the plan. But Alejandra tells him, screw the plan, she's leaving. Venom webs the vial before she can leave and says, now power am ours. However, before Venom can open the vial, Blackheart throws Ross at him, launching the two of them from the building. Blackheart then turns to Alejandra and tells her that her friends don't seem to want to see her back with the spirit. So if she tells him their plans, and without resistance, she does. Blackheart then says oily to the centrifuge and tells Alejandra, Ah, mortals, so many schemes. I truly love tormenting you. And he knocks her out the window. He calls out to Mephesto, stating, Look what you've become. And then he stops and he looks down and he sees Ross with the Venom symbiote and the Spirit of Vengeance. Meanwhile, in a back alley, Flash sits alone holding off a demon horde. He checks his remaining ammo and he tells himself, Giving Hulk the symbiote was a bad idea. Back in the tower, Blackheart tells them, So what? You've combined! Hell's hatred fuels! But his sentence is cut off when Ross fires a fire web in his face, yelling, Vengeance! Over at the centrifuge, Laura begins setting up the explosives as Oily grabs a hold of her. She fights back, but Oily tells her that gargoyles are versed in black magic. Alchemy, for example. She looks at her claws and sees them beginning to rust away. She then tells her how she's about to give her a little taste of her own medicine. Back in the alley, demons begin to overwhelm Flash, and suddenly a hand and reaches out grabbing him. Alejandra tells him, come on Stumpy, you're gonna help me get the spirit of vengeance back. Flash says that they kinda need that mixed up monster, but Alejandra stops him telling him she never agreed to this. Flash then says fine, but they need to stop the centrifuge first. She shouts that she's not going to help him, so Flash points his gun at her stating, I bet you will now. Meanwhile, Oily starts to cut and beat down on Laura, and through their fighting, Laura manages to place one of the bombs on Oily's back. But before she can hit the button, Oily grabs Laura and bites down on her neck. Seconds later, Flash and Alejandra drive by shooting her away. However, while Flash's focus is outside, Alejandra takes takes the chance and pushes Flash out the window. Oily watches as Ellie Hunter drives off and tells him, man, looks like you're screwed. Not only are your friends jerks, someone ran off with your legs. But then Oily remembers she had something to do. Oh right, kill Johnny Blaze. Flash grabs a hold of his gun and he takes aim. Boom! And pieces of Oily start to fall out of the sky. And Laura tells him good teamwork. Back over at the tower, Blackheart shouts, what can you do? Once I ingest the little spirit, but a creature shouts that it's found something. It's found his Hellion's Miro Cauldron. Light from the Miro shines and Blackheart shouts that there is nothing that can stop him. And then a voice tells him, let him heal his squalid heart, dear brother. As the light begins to fade, Alejandra says that they've had their fun. Now give back the spirit of vengeance. The spirit pulls away from Venom Hulk, stating, She's the host! And once the spirit bonds back with her, she takes off. Moments later, Blaze rides up with Laura and Flash, and Venom starts to leave Ross. Ross tells Flash thanks for the loan, and a voice then says, There you are. Everyone looks up to see Captain America, and he tells Flash, You're coming with me. Flash tells him, I've saved New York, you, and now Las Vegas. Will you just give me a break? Cap stares, and Giant Man and Beast agree. Maybe they should just let him help. Flash pulls back his mask and extends his hand, stating, There you go, the nerds have spoken. But while Flash and Cap shank, Steven asks Damon if there's something wrong. Damon looks at Flash, Ross, and Laura and sees the markings on their chest. And he says it's nothing. It's a problem for another day. A dark and stormy night as Hybrid jumps from building to building. The symbiote has bonded with Scott Washington, and Scott's done a good job at suppressing crime in his neighborhood because of it. But the demon will turn and become another spore. Through the rain, there's a man who manages to capture Hybrid, the man who helped spread the alien plague, the one who knows the cure. Eddie Brock stands above Hybrid, and he tells them, you put up a good fight. But he unloads a clip into Hybrid's chest, and he tells him, you didn't deserve this, as Eddie walks off. 
He tells them, None of them deserve this! But it's either them now or the entire planet later! Over at the Lighthouse Space Station, Beast tells Captain America how him and Hank were able to create a serum that will allow Flash to use the symbiote without risk of it permanently bonding to him. But as Venom is contained, Flash tells everyone that he does have enemies, and one day, he might need Venom in a hurry. Hank tells him not to worry, he's going to give him an emergency number, so when he calls it, he can send the suit through the phone with the help of Pym Particles. Flash tells himself that he has to sell it like he doesn't even want the thing, and says that it's fine now that he has his prosthetic legs. It'll be nice to get rid of the damn thing for a little while. Captain America shakes Flash's hand and he tells him that he's glad that they can make this whole thing work. He knows that he won't let him down. You see, after everything that Flash has recently done, Captain America wanted to get Agent Venom under control, but he knew that he was trying to be a good guy. So this is their answer. Flash tells Captain America, of course, and Valkyrie nudges Flash, telling him that she'll send him back home. After they leave, Beast mentions that if Flash is lying, they're gonna have a big problem, and Hank adds that there's another issue. Do they tell Spider-Man? A few moments later, Flash is teleported back to his home, just in time to hear a knock on his door. Peter Parker's voice says, he knows he's in there, the landlady says he hasn't left for days. Flash opens the door and tells him, I'm sorry, I was just in the shower. And Peter walks in stating that it's funny he still has all of his clothes on and his hair isn't even wet. Peter looks around the apartment and says that Betty came by his place crying a few days ago. She said that Flash had broken up with her over the phone and after a little digging, she also said that she contacted the VA to talk to his supervisor and now no one has even heard from him. Flash tells him, look, after my father died, I got stone drunk and I stayed that way. Peter tells him, come on. Let's get some fresh air then. While the two of them head out for coffee, the symbiote scream swings through the city. Of course, after hearing about Hybrid, she had to check out a few things herself. She begins to follow a trail down into the sewers, and the trail leads straight to Eddie Brock, who has set up a trap. He drops from the pipes above, releasing a sonic grenade that stuns Scream. And while she's stunned, he pulls out a knife that's been sitting in burning coal. Over at the coffee shop, Flash and Peter discuss some of Flash's recent problems, mainly the one about him dragging Betty down with him. Flash tries to tell him that he knows, but he's got to tell him something very important, so he has to promise not to tell anyone else. Peter tells him, of course, but before Flash can go on, his phone rings. As he looks at his phone, Flash tells Peter that it's his sister, and Peter says that he needs to go. A little while later, Flash heads over to his mother's house. Jesse says, look at him using legs, and Flash tells her that it's taking some getting used to, but on the road with a wheelchair is a hassle. He turns to his mother and he tells her that he's sorry that he had to leave right after the funeral, and she tells him that she's lived with a lying drunk for 46 years, but if he can't tell her the truth about what's going on with him, don't tell her anything. So if he wants to have a relationship with his mother, he needs to stop lying. Later, Flash heads home thinking to himself how, like before, he lied again. It's only because she's still in danger from Crime Master. But as Flash opens the door to his apartment, he sees Betty looking at their old pictures. He tries to talk, but Betty tells him no. He doesn't get to talk, since he couldn't even break up with her face to face. She came here to say that the man that he is isn't enough for her, and they will never be getting back together again. She slams the door on her way out, and then Flash gets a phone call. Hello, Dr. Pym. Yeah, I'm ready for work. Yeah, life at home is good. And seconds later, Flash is teleported away. Flash's mission had him escorting a prisoner to a new location, and the prisoner is the human fly. Fly explains that he's done some bad things, he's a bad guy, but there's another thing that he has to tell him about. He goes on to state that a week before they caught him, he swiped a few million dollars from Kingpin. Flash says that if he's trying to bribe him, but Fly says no, he just wanted to tell him about his son. Fly continues explaining that Kingpin knows he took the money, and if he doesn't get it back, they're gonna kill his son Sam. Flash tells him to just give him the information and they'll get his son into protective services. Fly then tells him, fine, forget it, because that won't help. But in my belongings, there's a letter to my son. Can you at least get my son that letter? But before Flash can even answer, Agent Dalrymple comes and stating that he needs some signatures for the transfer. So Flash follows, and once they're alone, Dalrymple says they have a situation. HQ just reported that the Kingpin has put out a $10 million marker on the fly. Flash tells him not to worry, they're randomizing their route. And Dalrymple stops, stating that finding them isn't the concern, it's the fact that one of their mandroids picked up the marker. So they need to secure them now. Flash walks back into the car, holding Dalrymple, telling the mandroids that this agent accepted a bribe for their prisoner. So they need to secure him and move the fly. As he goes to open the door, Fly asks, does he know what he's doing? And Flash tells him, keeping him safe. Then there's a struggle and the Hobgoblin kills the Mandroid stating, Hi, I'm not Agent Rumple. I'm the Hobgoblin. Hobgoblin then tells Flash, My employer would like to offer you a contract to help me kill the Fly. Then we'll help you kill Crime Master and Jack-O-Lantern. Doesn't that sound appealing to you? Flash and Hobgoblin begin to struggle back and forth and he tells Flash again that they want to give him $10 million. And Flash agrees. Fly shouts, fine, go ahead and kill me. 
Why don't you go ahead and help kill my son while you're at it? Flash holds his blade to Fly and he tells him, Does it make you mad? Mad enough to spit? Fly asks, What the- Oh, I get it. And he spits all over Hobgoblin. Hobgoblin tells him that it was a good trick. He has a few of his own and he begins to throw bombs back at them. Flash charges forward, but as he gets closer, Hobgoblin begins screeching, pulling Venom off of Flash. Next, Hobgoblin strikes down his fiery sword and he asks, How does that feel? Flash turns around, webbing up his mouth, stating that he's about to feel better, and he throws the two of them out of the train. Hobgoblin starts to hit down on Flash enough to break away and leave Flash to fall to the ground below. Fly then tries to escape, but Hobgoblin jumps on him, telling him that it's bad form to be leaving in the middle of their party. Fly flips Hobgoblin over and spits acid on his arm, and then he sinks his teeth into Hobgoblin. He shouts, can the Kingpin hear me chewing through your assassin yet? Hobgoblin pulls out a knife, and he stabs Fly to push him off, and then they both begin to hear something. From the overpass above, Flash drives a motorcycle off of the side, crashing it into the Hobgoblin, knocking him off the train. Flash then points his gun at Fly, and Fly says, You're gonna have to kill me to stop me. And then a voice calls out for help, and Flash sees a guard holding onto the side of the train. Fly tells him, Go save him, let me save my son. I'll turn myself in once it's all over. Flash stops for a moment, and then he reaches out to grab the guard's hand. The fly flies off, telling Flash, Please deliver the letter that I left. And Flash heads back in and grabs the letter, opening it. And that's when Flash's eyes widen as he reads the words, I don't have a son. As Flash sits in his apartment, he begins to think about how he used to have options. Run away from home or take the beatings. Stuff Peter in a locker or give him a swirly. Stay with Betty or break clean and spare her the heartache. But now, there is no choice. He has to do this. He picks up the phone and he tells Hank that he needs the suit. Hank asks if he needs some help, but Flash tells him that it's a local thug thing. He can handle it on his own. However, as Flash leaves and swings away, Eddie Brock is watching from afar. With the recent escape of the Fly, Crime Master has reached out and extended his hand to allow the Fly to join his group. Currently, Crime Master is working on a new project and he needs some specialists like the Fly to help him. But as the meeting goes on, Flash sits in the rafters above, aiming a rifle at Crime Master's head. Crime Master knows who he is. He knows his family. So right now, he needs to be a soldier and just kill the man. Down below, Crime Master makes a toast to their new putrid friend and he welcomes him to the Savage Six. Flash takes a breath and he aims his shot, and then a gun goes off. Two bullets fly at Flash, and he looks over and shouts, Brock? Eddie screams out, The symbiote must be annihilated! The world must be cleaned of its blight! As Flash falls, he quickly webs to catch himself, and then he webs Eddie in place. Once getting stable, Flash then opens fire on the villains down below. The living computer program, Megatac, creates a barrier to shield the group, and Crime Master tells Fly to go kill whatever son of a bitch is shooting at us. Jack O'Lantern flies up, telling Flash that he just knew it! Couldn't he just leave them alone? And Fly heads up, dropping Death Adder onto Flash. Flash tries to fight off the now three villains that are attacking him, but it doesn't last long before Flash comes crashing down to the ground. Crime Master says that he's a reasonable man. Maybe he'll just kill his mom over in Queens. Flash picks himself up, aiming his gun, and then part of Megatac's barrier slams down on him. The barrier pulls up and they shoot again, and Flash manages to pull back to avoid it. Right now, he just needs to escape. He has to get his bearings and then kill them. After Flash escapes, Jack notices that Flash seems to have left them a present up in the rafters. A short while later, Eddie wakes up stripped of all of his clothing. While Jack starts to open a canister, Crime Master tells Eddie that he saw profit in what Flash was doing with this whole superhero thing. But the thing that they missed was their symbiote didn't have a host. Toxin begins to crawl out, covering Eddie, and Crime Master begins to ask, How do you feel? What would you and your new friend like to do? And Toxin stands up, telling him, Kill Venom! But shortly after making sure that he wasn't followed, Flash heads over to Betty's apartment to check on her. There's no one home, but he sees a note in the fridge that Betty went to go meet Peter for coffee. Over at the coffee shop, Betty mentions to Peter that she is sick of being lied to by men. Heck, even her own brother Bennett got himself killed over gambling bets. And as the two of them go on, Betty notices her phone ring when Flash calls, so she doesn't answer. Peter gets up stating that he hates to leave, but Betty tells him it's fine. She knows that he has to get back to work. After Peter leaves, Betty's phone rings again and Betty says, Not now, Flash. Not now. She heads in line to get another cup of coffee and as she goes to pay, Jack hands the money over stating that this is on him. As the two of them walk out, Jack says that he needs to talk to her about something. It's about Flash. He leans in and Betty tells him that she's not so sure and then Jack grabs a hold of her arm. Seconds later, Flash crashes into the coffee shop, tackling Jack to the ground. Flash begins to beat on Jack, so Betty pulls out a sonic pepper spray and blasts it into Flash's head. He webs up the pepper spray and tells Betty to run. Flash then goes back to beating on Jack, and a giant arm punches through, knocking Flash away. And Jack tells him, meet Megatac. 
Jack laughs, stating that we need to go and find Betty. But Flash webs up Jack's face and flings him and Megatac into a wall. Flash escapes and he tries to call up Betty, but just as he holds the phone to his ear, Megatac's arm flies out, punching him. After falling to the ground, Flash decides that he just needs to leave the phone behind and go grab Betty. Once the two of them are safely away, Betty asks, what does he want? And Flash tells her he's trying to help her and right now she had better hang on. The two swing through the city and then two red tendrils shoot out towards them. Flash's grip on Betty is loosened as she starts to fall. And just before hitting the ground, Flash grabs onto her and then they hear a voice stating, we've come for you. Toxin comes charging at Flash and the two of them begin punching away at each other. Toxin then wraps Flash up and Flash begins to recognize the voice as Eddie Brock. Using the pepper spray from before, Flash pulls away and begins to blast Eddie in the face and now with Eddie stunned, Flash wraps him up and tells the people around to call 911. These restraints won't hold him for long. Flash then asks where did the woman that was with him go and the small child points towards the alley. He calls out to Betty and she tells him to leave her alone. And as the mask pulls back, Flash tells her that he's not going to hurt her more than he already has. Betty looks up and realizes that Venom is Flash and slaps him. She tells him that this whole time and Flash tells her that he's sorry, but she's in danger and they need to go. As the two of them swing through the city, Betty says, damn you Flash Thompson. And while swinging, he grabs onto a man's cell phone to call his mother. Back with his mom, she lays in the ground as the fly asks, who could that be? Betty says that she's not answering, and then Megatac's face appears on the cell phone. Betty tosses the phone as Megatac reaches out, but the grab misses. Flash then heads over to his sister Jessie's apartment to check on her, but as he walks through the place, he sees Jessie's husband with the top of his head cut off. Next to the bed, Jessie's voice calls out, who's there? And Flash reaches out, grabbing a blanket, and as he pulls it away, the devil dolls spring out. Flash destroys most of them, and then he notices one of the eyes on one of them is changing into a countdown. He quickly runs back out of the apartment, grabbing Betty, and just as they get away, the building explodes. And as the smoke pours into the air, Flash notices something shoot out from it and realizes Jack came back to watch the show. Following the smoke, Flash soon finds Jesse tied up on the roof of a building. Flash makes his way down and Jack slashes away at his back, yelling, Boo! Look at the two of us! We both got hot dates! And we both just leave them on rooftops! Flash reaches out for his gun and he begins to fire at Jack. Though he misses most of his bullets, one does hit Jack right in the side. He grabs a hold of Flash and begins to pour fire onto his face, throwing him off at the side of the roof. While Flash is washing the fire off, Jack picks up Jesse and tosses her over the ledge. Flash quickly swings down, catching her, and then suddenly he hears Betty scream for help. He looks over to see Toxin grabbing onto Betty, and Jack says, Tough break, but I've gotta go now. Bullet holes to patch up. But before he goes, he does have one question. Have you visited your mother recently, Flash? As Toxin and Jack leave, Flash heads over to his mother's apartment to find it destroyed. He begins to check the bio left by Fly, and Flash is hit in the back! He turns around to see Death Adder, and Death Adder knocks Flash into a wall. He grabs onto every knife that he can, and he jumps back, stabbing at Death Adder, and the two of them begin to struggle. But after Death Adder knocks Flash away again, he begins to escape. As Death Adder runs, Flash webs him up by the head and slams him back into the apartment. Death Adder continues to try and run away. But as he runs through a woman's apartment, Flash jumps onto his back. He screams for the woman to get out, and thinks how he doesn't want her to see this, and with one quick jerk of the head, Flash snaps Death Adder's neck and he falls to the ground. Some of the other tenants in the apartment building begin to come out, and he decides that it's time for him to leave. A short while later, over at the Lower East Side, the fly begs for him not to do it. And without any words, Flash's mother watches in horror as the fly begins to scream. Flash stands over the fly, holding a recently cut off wing, asking, Where is she? And Fly shouts to Flash's mother, telling him to look at what her boy is doing. Flash leans down, telling him, You better not speak to her again, or we'll see how well you fly with one wing and no eyes. The Fly says, Fine! I'll talk! And Flash turns to his mother, stating, Ma'am, close your eyes. Flash cuts off the second wing and tells Fly, you wanted to talk, right? So talk. Meanwhile, over at the abandoned shipyard, Betty wakes up as one of Crime Master's men directs her into another room. She steps through the door and sees pictures of her and Bennett. Crime Master tells her it's quite a shrine, isn't it? An ode to Bennett and his little sister, Betty. Crime Master begins to pull his hood off, stating how that family was stripped for him, and now crime is his family. Betty looks at the man, realizing that it's her brother, Bennett. Bennett says he's right here, and he's offering her a second chance to be together, and she's gonna watch him murder the hell out of Flash Thompson. As the night begins to fall, one of the guards asks, why does he have a silencer on his gun? What do they need to do that's quiet? Bullets begin to fire at the guard, and Flash reverts the suit back to his normal look. 
back inside. Bennett begins to explain that he was in a bad place in life, he was shot and killed. And what stung more is that his sister thought that he was nothing more than a gutter trash gambler. After pushing her away, he tells her that he can't blame her. He's bettered himself now though. That day he was shot and he suddenly woke up in a secret morgue and began to walk through the hallways. Though he wasn't sure as to why they saved him, they chose him. They chose him to fulfill a great destiny and live on the noble tradition, a crime master for every generation. As Bennett goes on, one of the guards runs in stating that he's here. And out in the hallways, Flash begins to fight off Megatech. However, Megatech's power slowly begins to win the fight. He says that even though Flash is weak, his code is clean. And Toxin's voice tells him, No mercy! It's not your right to offer him such kindness! Toxin appears and he bites down on Megatech's head shouting, He's mine! As Megatech begins to fade away, Flash begins to fight off Toxin. He throws some smoke grenades out there and Toxin shouts, How weak that you resort to trickery! But through the smoke, Toxin sees Flash and he rips him to pieces! And then he shouts, What's this? And Flash shouts, It's a decoy! And he opens fire. Literal fire begins to cover Toxin and Flash jumps into Toxin's mouth, spreading it open. He reaches down and he begins to pull Eddie out of it, and he drops another set of grenades into the symbiote's mouth. As the symbiote begins to burn, Toxin reaches out trying to pull Eddie back to him to try and escape. But while both Toxin and Eddie burn, Eddie screams, What have you done to me? The flames begin to take over Eddie as he screams out in pain, and Flash runs off thinking how Eddie didn't deserve that. Deeper down in the facility, Betty tells Bennett that she'll do whatever he wants, just leave Flash alone. And Bennett asks if she really thinks that he's foolish enough to convince him that she's just going to be his doting sister crime mistress. He goes on stating how she'll just betray him the first chance that she gets, and Flash calls out that he's right, he's going to die. Jack flies up telling Flash that he's getting bored of their rival, but his sentence is cut short when Flash jumps down, knocking Jack off of his broom. Jack's body begins to hang over a vat of acid as he tries to call for help, but soon Jack's legs give out, and he falls below. Hello. Crime Master points his gun laughing. <laughs> He's a tough kid, he'll be fine. But he shouts for Flash to wait, it's her brother. And Flash tells her it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who he is! Bennett fires his gun, releasing sonic shots that are stunning Flash. And then he begins to fire fire at him to burn Venom away. Venom starts to fall off of Flash's body, and Bennett says, Get ready for another shot! And as the gunshot goes off, Bennett looks down at his chest. He falls to his knees, and Betty stands behind him with tears in her eyes. As he loses his strength, he falls off the ledge into the vat of acid. He stands up, stating that that was her brother, and Betty tells him that her brother died a long time ago. Shortly after the two of them leave, Flash tells Betty that he never knew. But she tells him it wouldn't have changed anything. He says that he never meant for things to turn out this way. And Betty says that she knows he didn't. But for what it's worth, she forgives him. But she does not ever want to see him again. After Betty heads home, Flash returns to the lighthouse station and tells everyone that he may have hit a big stumble. It didn't go well, but it's time for him to come clean. As time passed, Flash begins to think about how normally this is the kind of day where families have those fuzzy feelings, sunny memories. But for him, that was never really the case. His father beat him, and in turn, he beat others. And right now on Father's Day, Jack is making it a point to let Flash know that he's still alive with all of these killings. Jack was brainwashed into thinking that Bennett, the crime master, was his father, and the killings escalated on Father's Day. With those killings, Jack made it a point to leave clues as to where to find him. So Flash followed those clues, and as he walks into the sewers, he finds a door with an X on it. The door flies open, and at the end of the table sits Flash's father's corpse with its head carved out, telling him, have a seat. The corpse goes on stating how he never really liked him. It took all of his strength to not crush his skull in. Flash allows rage to begin to flow through, and he slams down screaming, You rotten son of a bitch! The table breaks and the body slumps over, and it says, I'm back to kick your ass one last time, because behind the body is a bomb, and it begins to beep. The explosion goes off and Jack jumps down asking if it was nice seeing his dad again because he knows how much it hurt to lose one. He slashes at Flash's back and he begins to cut away at his chest. And Jack says that Jesse told him a lot of things about his dad and almost made him feel sorry for him. Flash tries to crawl away, but Jack steps on his head and raises the sickle. Before he can strike down, Flash turns back shooting his gun into Jack's chest. He then jumps up beating Jack, letting the rage out just like how his father used to do back then. And once Jack stops moving, Flash points his gun down at Jack's head. Flash says that their father's hatred will run through their veins. He picks up Jack's body and he goes on stating, but if we make a different choice, who knows what'll happen? And with that, Jack was taken in to be arrested and things go back to the way they were. Betty staying away from Flash, Flash's mother being alone, and Flash going to bed, looking at a picture of his family, smiling and happy.
flash things back to all of the events that led him up to this point, including returning to the Avengers and Hawkeye yelling at him. Hawkeye wanted to make it clear that his next mission was to be recon only, and he was not to engage the enemy. But as Flash continues to sit there, a woman's voice tells him that she's been standing there for a little while now, and he has yet to notice her. But she wouldn't give her a peek inside of that brain. Flash looks up and asks if she's the reporter, and the woman tells him yes, Katie Kernan of the Daily Inquisitor. After handing Flash a paper, she asks if anyone told him that he looks like Spider-Man. He tells her yeah. It also comes with a, I thought you would be bigger, but a different guy. Katie then asks why does he need her help? The stories that she puts out are not very newsworthy, and she suspects that he already has connections. After flipping through the papers, Flash says, yeah, but those guys haven't come up with anything yet, and I need information on these guys, as he pulls out a picture. The picture is a building, the building of the Department of Occult Armaments, a secret Nazi occult weapons division. Katie tells him that it's not really any of her business, but those guys are bad news, and Flash says there's no need to worry. He's just going in for a simple sneak and peek operation, except that's not what happens. Flash jumps through the halls of the DOA, shooting at all of the attacking occultists. The moment that he walked through the doors, his comms went out and he had to make a judgment call, which isn't exactly his strong suit. But as the last of the occultists fall, Flash looks around and sees rows of containers, each holding a person. After pulling one man out and seeing if he's still alive, Flash gets ready to pull the next one out when the man suddenly lunges at him. The man shouts, you're too late, his soul is mine. His eyes begin to change and then suddenly he stops and falls to his knees. He says that he did not realize, please forgive him, please come command him. Not really sure what's going on, Flash tells him, I command you to get the hell out of here. The man says, as you desire. A demon spirit then releases itself from him. Flash asks if he really just banished a demon, and then an explosion goes off behind him. A voice tells Flash that he knew that they would meet again. He just didn't think that it would be so soon. He looks up to see Damon Hellstrom. Damon used to be one of the good guys until he betrayed everyone, and Flash knows that he can't handle this alone, so he needs to get outside. But as Flash tries to escape, Damon blasts him with fire, knocking him back down to the ground. Damon jumps into strike, but before he can hit, Flash grabs a hold of him and slams him to the ground. He quickly then jumps on top of him, holding his gun to Damon's head, telling him to talk. Damon says that he's pretty sure the possession engines speak for themselves, but obviously he's building an army. But that isn't really what's bothering him, is it? Flash then asks, how could you have betrayed everything? And Damon laughs. <laughs> the two of us are alike in that regard. The mark on Damon's chest begins to glow, and Flash is knocked away. He jumps up, blasting Venom again into one of the possession engines, and ooze begins to pour over him. Flash's body begins to change and grow bigger, as the mark from Mephesto begins to shine. Soon, a Venom stands up, roaring as loud as he can. Venom shouts, what is this? I see no offering. I hunger. Damon tells the occultists to go fetch their guest a snack. Venom reaches down and grabs one of the occultists and crunch, and he says, that was disgusting. And Damon says, of course, without appropriate preparations. But luckily, we have some more for you. Three men sit in the ooze from before and they tell Venom, Thank the Dark Lord, we are the sacrifice! But as Venom looks, Flash begins to take back control of the suit, and he sees the men begging for him not to eat them. Venom begins to scream and Damon says, Bravo! Clawing her way out from beneath the demon's influence, that is no simple feat. You'll make an impressive addition to my little zoo. Flash shouts for him to shut up, but he punches Damon to the ground. While the occultists try to help Damon, Flash tries to make his escape, and as he gets outside of the facility, he asks himself, what is it that Damon did to him? Whatever it is, it was like a monster was put inside of him, but the symbiote likes the way it feels. A little while later at Katie's apartment, she hears a window suddenly being opened as she reaches for her gun. A voice calls out to her, and Flash pulls himself in, telling Katie that he doesn't know what to do. He needs help. She sits him down, telling him that she'll get him some water, and Flash says that he doesn't need water. He thinks he needs an exorcist. A short while later, Katie takes Flash to see a friend of hers, Reggie, who happens to be an exorcist. He sits tied to a chair, and Reggie asks Katie if she, you know, wants to look under the mask. She tells him to just do what they came for, and Reggie says, fine, and he pulls a chair next to Flash. He tells Katie that he hasn't done this since he was in the church, so... He then turns to Flash and says that he wishes to speak to the entity that is nested inside of this man. Flash says father. And Reggie says, okay, why have you, um, chosen this vessel? Flash's voice begins to change, and he says, oh, I chose nothing. This isn't what I was promised. I was promised power, an endless slaughter, but this man is marked. It is forbidden. 
Reggie asks, forbidden by who? And Flash remains silent. Suddenly, the demon Venom grabs Reggie and shouts that he tries to break free, but the vessel drags him back. Get him out of here, please! After letting go, Flash begins to change back to normal and he asks, What happened? Am I exercised? And Reggie says, It, uh, looks like the demon wants to leave, but can't. So my advice? Go back to whoever did this. As the night begins to fall in the Bronx Zoo, Damon walks through with his group of occultists. After sending one away to report back to Mistress Sin, Flash begins whipping out from one of the robes. He tells Damon, let's just cut to the chase. What did you do to me? And he slams him back down to the ground. He grabs and picks up everyone telling Damon that he is going to fix this. And Damon tells him that there is nothing to fix. It looks like you're in control. And Flash throws everyone shouting, you put a demon inside of me and I want it out. Damon just laughs, telling him all of that anger and hatred. Maybe you had a demon all along. Suddenly, an explosion goes off behind Flash, knocking him away. And Flash can feel the demon inside recognizing something. Recognizing its own. A spiked tail jets out, knocking Flash further back. And fetishes leap out to grab him. Damon takes his trident and cracks Flash across the face, telling him that he would like to introduce him to some of his friends. The monsters of evil! The demons begin to gang up, beating down on Flash. And the flaming bull bites down, trying to eat him. But Flash fights back, shooting spikes out of the roof of the bull's mouth. Soon after breaking free, the demons continue putting Flash right back into the ground, and as the Sphinx pins Flash down, Damon asks if he would like to join them. Let me show you your true purpose. Flash pushes the Sphinx off, and he points his gun at Damon, telling him, Go after yourself! Damon smiles and says, That's a pity. The bull charges and knocking Flash off into the distance, and he tells the monsters to go find him. If you won't join us, rip the Hellspawn free from his flesh. As the Sphinx begins searching, Flash waits and jumps up, grabbing onto one of its heads. He then punches through the mouth of one, and spikes shoot out, destroying part of it. As the Sphinx falls to the ground, the mark begins to glow on Flash's chest. The rest of the monsters begin to gather around, and Flash tells them to hold, and they do. Elsewhere, Damon walks off, and Flash calls out to him. Damon just laughs, stating, I see you're still alive, but you're outnumbered and outmatched here. Flash tells him, you're wrong about one thing. I'm not alone. All of the monsters of evil jump out and begin ripping Damon apart. He then tells the monsters, that's enough. Now get lost and only forage for berries or something. He leans down to Damon and says, that's something, isn't it? Seems that we have a lot to talk about, huh? After transporting Damon into a holding cell, he tells Flash that he might want to get a chair. This might take a while. Flash begins to ask why he is able to control the demons. And Damon says, frankly, it's because of the mark. Back in Las Vegas, when you and your friends became marked, there's a process known as the Descent. A day when one of the Hell Lords fall farther than the others and becomes a true devil. And Mephesto is preparing for it. He's marking his potential heirs. Flash tells him that he's no devil, and Damon tells him, I'm not either. At least not yet. Once the descent has occurred, one of us will be, or neither of us. Or it could be another marked. Damon then looks through the glass and tells Flash, We're gonna help each other, but if you refuse, think hard about it. Would you rather see me sitting on the throne, or would you rather see a real jerk get the job? A short while later, Flash begins to head over to Katie's apartment to inform her of the current situation and also to thank her. As she sits there, she asks him if he needs something else. He says that he's not done with the DOA yet, and no one knows as much about the supernatural as she does, other than maybe Doctor Strange. Katie says that he would be surprised how much he calls her, but either way, she'll help. But this is not off the record. She needs to put food on the table. Flash tells her that that's fair, and she asks, what is it that she needs to be researching now? And he tells her, let's start with the end of the world. Afterwards, Flash calls up Betty to let her know that he's just checking up on her and making sure that she's safe, even if she's still not answering the phone. But just as he's leaving the message, he's interrupted by a transmission from the Lighthouse Station telling him to report to Colorado. They have a prison break. An individual named Cletus Cassidy. It's only been three hours since the prison break, and Flash arrives to investigate what happened. Flash has been through a lot in these past few days, but at the end of the day, he still tells himself that he is a superhero. As Flash leads a group of soldiers into the prison, he thinks about all of the cold-blooded killers here, and there's only one person who would take delight in this. Right now, that man is missing from his cell. But as everyone goes to check on Cletus' cell, there's one thing strange about it. The glass was broken from inside of the cell, meaning he used something to break out. A few hours later, at I-25, the police begin to set up a checkpoint on the interstate to try and see if Cletus Cassidy is trying to leave the state. As one cop stops a truck, he begins to notice that this man is Cletus Cassidy. The cop pulls out a gun and he tells him not to move, but Cletus tells him that his new friends went through a lot of trouble to break him out, and he doesn't take kindly to threats. They say that they've got big plans for me. 
Suddenly, the cop's neck is then slit, and an explosion goes off, blowing everyone away. As Cletus drives off, he smiles, telling them, Told ya! Back at the prison, Flash goes over the surveillance video of the attack, and as he watches, he sees the guards being killed by something, and then he zooms in on a falling guard's back. He then sees a small creature, and Flash says that he needs to call this in. He steps outside to make contact with the lighthouse station to report his findings, and he tells them that he will track this, but he will need help on this. And after that, Flash makes a call to Katie Kernan. He tells her to give him anything that she has related to tiny killers. Seconds later, she sends over an article about something called the Prometheus Pit, and it's being built in Houston, Texas. A few days later, over in Houston, the failed clone experiment of Spider-Man known as Kane, now going by the name of Scarlet Spider, receives a call of a burning building with people trapped inside. He jumps into the building and he finds a body, but it's a person who was killed rather than died from the smoke, and this person's death while the killer savored in the killing. Kane then sees another man in the corner repeating, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, over and over again. Kane reaches out to grab the man and the man screams in fear of him, but regardless, Kane grabs him and he escapes. A little while later, Kane learns that the man that was killed was Nell Fletcher. The man he rescued is Ryan Catola, Nell's son-in-law. The only thing that they were able to get out of Ryan is that someone who looked like the Scarlet Spider did this, and that monster's real target was his wife. Over at the Lyndon B. Johnson Space Station, Katie sits with Dr. Catola regarding the rumors about their exploration of a subatomic universe. Katie mentions that she does know that a few years ago her team decided to start back up the research that Professor Philip Prometheus started regarding it. Dr. Catola tells Katie that whatever she may have heard, it is a highly classified situation, and currently, she does not have the time to discuss it. She will call security to escort Katie out. But before she can call security, a voice tells her, Sorry, they just went off the clock! Soon, Katola and Katie turn to see Cletus skewering the guards, and he jumps at the doctor telling her, Your husband says hi! As Carnage leaps through the air, Kane bursts through the window, punching Carnage away from the women. Kane turns to them and tells them to run, but Carnage gets back up, stating, I guess I'm gonna have to kill you! I'm gonna miss all the jokes and- Kane jumps in, snapping Carnage's neck, and Carnage says, Wait! That was different! I like it! One of Carnage's tendrils shoot out, stabbing Kane, and then using the retractable claws in his hands, Kane cuts the tendrils off. Carnage says that he's starting to think that this guy really isn't Spider-Man, and Kane tells him that he's about to see how much different they are. Suddenly, Kane's body is electrocuted and he falls to the ground, and Carnage tells him, Meet my little friends! And Kane looks up to see a group of little tiny people. Carnage leans in to kill Kane, but before he can, he's shot in the back, and Katie yells at him to get away. Carnage turns, grabbing Katie and Katola, and he says that he knows the scientist, but who are you? Katie says that she's a reporter, and Carnage tells her, I'm gonna give you something to report on soon. Soon, Carnage and the group of tiny people break into the Prometheus room, and they begin to activate the pit. The pit begins to light up, and Carnage tosses Katie in, telling her, you first! One of the tiny people then tells Carnage that it's time to move out. Remember their deal. But before Carnage can jump in, his arm is webbed up, and Kane tells him, I'm not done with you yet. Carnage throws Katola in, stating, Well, I'm done here! Tired of all of you people being so angry! Taking away my towns, locking me up, tearing me in half! He jumps into the pit and he begins to fade. And as Kane screams that he's going to kill him, a voice tells him to step away from the pit. Flash Thompson appears telling Kane to get on the ground and put your hands on your head. Kane jumps on Flash with his claws out and Flash tells him, you may want to rethink that. Flash goes on stating, we just need to settle down. But after Kane is yelling, F you! Flash tells him, we saw what Carnage can do. We need to stomp him. Kane steps back telling Flash, never touch me again or I will kill you. I know all about you, but why is Carnage here? What the crap are those little people? Flash then explains that those those people helped Carnage break out of his prison, and then his words trail off. Kane asks what's going on, and suddenly Venom takes over, and Flash yells for him, RUN! The tendrils from Venom begin to wrap around Kane, and Kane begins to punch upwards with his claw through Venom's mouth. Venom tries to attack, but Kane jumps up, punching him down, and he begins beating into him. Kane tells him, stay down, and then Venom's hand reaches up, grabbing Kane's wrist and slamming him into the ground. Slowly, Venom begins to get smaller, and Flash fights to gain control until finally, the suit reverts back to Agent Venom. Kane shouts, you son of a, what was that? But as Kane goes on, Flash tells tells him to shut up. We have a survivor over there. Katola says that they went through the Prometheus portal. They took the reporter to the Microverse. She goes on stating that it is a universe that is on the subatomic scale, and there's life there. Flash says that they have to go after them, but Kane tells him, F that. Carnage is gone, so good riddance to that. Flash tries to tell him that Carnage will come back, but Kane says, Once he crossed into the Microverse, that whole thing stopped being my problem. Meanwhile, in the Microverse, Carnage says that he finally has a world all to himself now, and Katie says that she's going to die, isn't she? Carnage tells her, You can't die yet. You have to be my witness, and you're gonna have to live for now. 
As the micro group watches, the female of the group reports back that they managed to bring Carnage into their world, but they're not so sure about this decision. The hologram tells her that Carnage will do his job. Now they better do their job and bring him in. Back in the macroverse, Katola finishes the repairs on the pit, but before Flash can step in, Kane walks up asking, do you really think that Carnage is gonna come back? And Flash says, if it's one thing that I learned, it's that the bad ones always come back. So Kane asks him, at this point, can it get any worse? I know another idiot who always talked about responsibility. And Flash responds with, Yeah, well, I know a great man who does the same. The two step through the portal and moments later, Flash wakes up alone. He looks around the new world and he notices little fairies flying around. One of the fairies says, It burns! And Flash notices the symbiote from his boots sticking into the ground. The fairies begin to scream, Corruptors! And they begin attacking Flash with Sonic screaming. The symbiote begins to rip apart, but as Flash tries to run away, a green beam shoots out, knocking away the fairies. He looks over to see a group of people and the man leading them says that his name is Arctorius Ron and they need his help. Elsewhere, Kane begins to wake up stating how he hates everything right about now. And a voice tells him, heat is self-destructive. I can feel the rage inside of you. Kane looks up to see a man and he tells him, thanks, but what happened? Where is this? And most importantly, who the crap are you? The man tells him, I'm called many things, but above all, I am a man and I am preparing. Kane asks for what? And the man says, to die. Kane turns back to see a giant monster about to eat them, and he says, Probably should have led with that. Meanwhile, in another area, Carnage looks around a facility called the Body Banks, and he says that he's a little disappointed. He thought there would be, you know, bodies! The female leader explains that this is a flesh factory. They churn out perfect men and women and beasts. And as she continues, Katie tells Carnage that he knows that he's not here as an assassin, right? They brought him to use him as raw material. Carnage jumps down stating, you're pretty smart. Must be those reporter instincts. But I bet you're going to be real surprised when you know what I'm about to do. A little while later, Arcturus welcomes Flash aboard his ship, and he introduces everyone there as the Enigma Force. Flash tries to say his name, but Flair says that he's the Corruptor, so she would rather not know his name. As Marionette and Flair express their concerns of bringing the Corruptor with them, Arcturus says that it's not up to them, the Redeemer wants to see him. Suddenly, the ship's alarms begin to go off, and Arcturus tells everyone that they have the ships from Marquis Radu's armada coming out of warp right in front of them. Battle stations everyone. Back over with Kane, he begins to fight off the giant monster that was about to eat. Him. He quickly jumps onto its back and he stamps into it, but as he jumps away, the monster grabs him out of the air and he shouts to the hooded man, Hey, I can use some help over here! The monster pins Kane down, and just as it's about ready to eat him, Kane grabs its jaws and rips it off! He walks back over to the man and he says, I'm not sure if you noticed or not, but I did save us, so a little thanks. But the man stops him and tells him to sit. He will tend to his wounds. Sure, I'll bite. Who are you? The man says that he's been called many things, a king, a traitor, and some have even called him the Redeemer, but the names are meaningless. All that matters is his purpose. Kane then asks, and that would be? And the man reaches out, touching Kane's head, stating, I am a healer. Back at the Body Bank's plant, Carnage kills off a few people who brought him out, asking if they really thought that they could make an army of Carnage soldiers, because one of him is already enough. But before Carnage can kill another of them, the female leader charges in, stating that she told Marquise that this man was unstable. Carnage jumps onto one and begins ripping him apart, and the female says that he will be dead and they will strip the Corruptor off of him and breed him. Carnage walks over, ripping the electronic snakes out of the female's head, and then he walks over to the man that he has pinned along the wall. The man asks what does he want, and Carnage says that he needs a chauffeur. With all of the things happening, he wants to meet with the guy who's pulling the strings. Over at Arcturius' ship, the Enigma Force fends off against the enemies who are now trying to board their ship, and as the group fights, Flash throws one of the men away, and then another one comes running in with a sonic blaster, stripping Venom off of him. Suddenly, everyone hears a scream, and they turn back to see Venom, tearing through everything in its path. Elsewhere, Kane and the Redeemer continue traveling as the Redeemer explains that there is a war going on. A giant mobile base starts walking by, and the Redeemer says that it's Marquis Radu, and as the Redeemer, he has come here to heal the Marquis. Suddenly, the two hear Carnage's voice telling him, that's really sweet, but I also happen to be looking for the same guy. So the healing plan sounds kind of boring. He leaps off the cliff telling them, Be real still. I'm going to make your deaths as slow and agonizing as humanly possible. Back on Arcturius's ship, Venom begins killing everything in sight, like I just said. And that's when Bug tells everyone, look on the bright side, at least the Corruptor is killing the bad guys too. Venom begins attacking Arcturius's crew when Flash tries to get control of Venom. And that's when Flair starts to sing. Slowly, Venom stops attacking, and Flash says that the song is soothing the symbiote. If you haven't been following our Agent Venom storylines, Flash Thompson is using the Venom symbiote when it behaves and listens to him as a weapon at his disposal. But at times, the Venom symbiote goes 
crazy, gaining control of itself, and it has no conscience. It just kills everything. But as this battle ends, Flair says that she still thinks that they should have killed this thing. And that's when the alarms start to go off. Everyone on the ship begins to fall as the ship rams into a giant structure. Arcturus gives the order for everyone that is on the bridge to move and get out, and that's when the ship doors burst open. Back with Kane, he tries to fight off Carnage as Carnage has found him and jumped him. But the entire time, Carnage keeps shouting, "Mar! Mar!" As Kane punches, the Carnage symbiote jumps off of Cletus Cassidy and bites down on Kane's head. Kane manages to kick him off just as the Scarlet Spider would, and he goes right back to beating Carnage's face. But as the fight goes on, Katie finds the Redeemer and he tells her that the Corruptor's cancer is spreading. Everything is falling apart. The rock that they are standing on begins to crack and the Redeemer pushes Katie back to solid ground. But while the rock is crumbling, Kane jumps off of Carnage to grab the Redeemer. He will not let him fall. Carnage jumps over to the ledge and he tells Katie, I didn't see that coming! And then a blinding light shines down. Soldiers begin descending upon him, shouting for him to stand down. A short while later, Flash Thompson walks over to Arcturus in restraints asking, how long was I out? Arcturus tells him not long enough. This is the part where Marquis Radu kills them. Flash mentions that this guy must be the bad guy. He's seen bad in his time. But Arcturus tells him, well, he's trying to kill God. Marquis then arrives. And soon a voice tells him that the symbiote doesn't believe in those things, does he? A symbiote only consumes. And he would like him to consume God. But as Marquis goes on, the other soldiers begin to bring Carnage in with them. And he tells everyone that this is going to make killing them so much easier. Carnage breaks out of his restraints and he asks, Why didn't you just say you wanted me to kill? Nothing would make me happier! Marquis tells him, with all due respect, I'm not interested in your happiness. And he slams Carnage's face down into the ground. Marquis then tells the soldiers to bring Arcturus and his Enigma Force to the cells and bring the symbiotes to the banks. As the groups are taken away, Marquis tells Katie to come with him. He understands that she's a historian from the Macroverse. Katie asks what is this all about and he tells her that the Microverse has always been in war, overseen by a Mad God, and he intends to end that. Katie then asks if he's sure that it's not God who's mad, and the Marquis tells her, Oh, he's sure. Now look. Her head is pushed into the light as she begins to see visions, and Marquis explains that some time ago the Microverse was breached by the symbiotes. Those symbiotes were like a poison. Their mere presence alone break things down. And in the end, as the symbiotes tried to bond with God to consume it, the Enigma Force destroyed the beasts and expelled them from the Microverse. Katie then asks, Why would you bring them back then, referring to the fact that he summoned Carnage, which caused Venom to chase after. Marquis says that he wants to be God, and in order for him to be God, he has to kill the old God first. Back on the planet, Kane asks the Redeemer if he's okay, to which he replies with, I'm obviously dying. Kane then asks, okay, beyond that are you okay? The Redeemer explains that the symbiotes are a poison to the Enigma Force, and he is the living embodiment of that force. Kane asks, why don't you all just leave then? And the Redeemer says that it's not that simple. If things here in the Microverse are destroyed, then it will destroy the Macroverse as all things are tied together. That's when Kane realizes how bad this could be. Crap. And the Redeemer adds, crap indeed. Over in the body banks, the soldiers begin to cart Flash and Carnage down the halls. But as Flash looks around, he slowly realizes that the army that they want to build will be out of them. He now sees what Carnage saw. They are building a symbiote army. Once they are secured in, Flash begins to see visions of Venom the Symbiote's past. The Symbiotes have already taken over planets in the Microverse, and then they were later wiped out by the Enigma Force. And right now, him and Carnage brought them back. Flash watches as the people in the containers begin to squirm as the Symbiotes consume them! And just as the Symbiotes are a poison to this world and everything that they touch, Flash sees his restraints slowly corroding away, and then they release him. Just as Flash and Carnage break away, so do all of these new symbiote soldiers. Flash jumps to attack Carnage, but as he does, Carnage tells him, It's said that our kids will have to pick a side! And all of the clones begin to surround Flash. Everyone begins to attack, and Carnage says that he must be feeling rather impotent, seeing all of the clones listen to me! Flash hears all of the voices of the clones. They're in his head, but the venom has been altered and changed, and Carnage is just pure symbiote. So for Flash to have a fighting chance, he has to start thinking like him, thinking real me. He leaps into the air and he cuts off Carnage's head. But even without his head, the clones begin to attack. Suddenly, Carnage hears someone calling out to him, and Kane jumps in, stabbing him. While Flash fights off the clones, he tells Kane that he thought he was dead, and Kane tells him, You're lucky that I'm not. 
The Redeemer tells all of them that they must hurry. The Corruptor is growing stronger and will soon bring both the universes crashing down. Kane shouts, that's right, they're playing for keeps here. And Carnage jumps on his back, boring himself into Kane's mouth, telling him, you're mouthy like the other spider. Carnage slams Kane into the ground and Flash jumps in, grabbing Carnage. As the two of them begin to struggle, Flash slowly begins to gain control and he throws Carnage away. And as the clones surround Kane and the Redeemer, Flash tells himself that he might be able to control the clones. He just has to remember. Remember the beatings that he used to get, all of the bruises, the broken bones, the phantom pain from his legs. Remember everything. And then he lets out a massive roar and all of the clones fall to pieces. Carnage begins laughing from his broken body. <laughs> You probably think that you saved the day, but I'm just getting warmed up. Slowly, Carnage's body begins to sink into the cracks, and the Redeemer says that he can no longer sense Carnage's presence anymore. So Kane asks, where could he have gone? Back over in Houston, bodies lay scattered all along the ground, and a close-up of one of their faces shows small red creatures. And those creatures are symbiote clones! Elsewhere in the city, an old man begins to cough, and then he slowly begins to spit up something red. Soon, everyone else begins to scream out in pain as the clones start attacking everything in sight, but on a microscopic level. Back in the microverse, the Redeemer and the rest of Arcturius's crew get aboard their ship, and the Redeemer tells them that it's time. Before leaving and being sent back, Mari hands Flash some of the sonic weapons that the soldiers were using against him when fighting. In case you were unaware, sonic weapons and fire are the two weaknesses of symbiotes. Mari says that he might be able to use them on Carnage, but Flair says unless he wants to come back. And if he does, he can use it on himself. Even though Marquis managed to escape, it is time for them to return to their world. Suddenly, Flash, Kane, and Katie are covered in the light and they arrive back in Houston. And as they fall out of the portal, they realize one slight problem. One teeny problem. One itty bitty problem. They're still really small. Flash remembers Dr. Cotola mentioning that something like this could happen when they returned, though the effects would only be temporary. Except the problem that they face now is that Carnage has had time for that to wear off. Carnage is now full grown and he begins laughing. <laughs> as he slams down on the three of them. But as they get away, the clones begin to attack. The two fight off what they can, but more and more clones begin to crawl out. And once there is too many of them, Carnage grabs both Flash and Kane, telling them, it's like you wanted to be killed or something. Carnage tightens his grip, but Flash and Kane begin to glow and shoot out of his hands as they grow back to normal size. The two of them look at Carnage, and they notice that Carnage's size is still much larger due to him being able to absorb his clones. They begin killing off as many of the clones as they can, but the clones begin to overrun Kane. They begin to bring down our Scarlet Spider. Carnage bites down on Flash and he tells him, you need to relax, just let it happen. Flash pulls out one of the sonic bombs that Mari gave him and he drops it. He tries to climb back out, but as he reaches the teeth of Carnage's body, the bomb explodes. The blast blows parts of Venom off of him and Kane runs over to help Flash up. But as Cletus starts to get back up without the Carnage symbiote around him, Kane looks at him and pops a claw. In a split second, Kane stabbed Cletus in the eye and Flash runs over to ask him, what did you do? Kane tells him, how many has he killed? How many times do we have to lock him up so that he can break out just so he can kill again? Flash asks him, what separates us from them? What makes them different? There has to be another way. And Kane swings away, telling Flash, get back to me when you find that answer. As time passed, the Prometheus pit was dismantled. Dr. Cotola quit her job, and the city grieved over the loss of the people that Carnage had killed. But as the people and the heroes go their separate ways, Flash stands in front of Cletus' cell. The doctors state that after the wound that he received, Cletus has become completely catatonic. He's effectively been lobotomized. Flash asks if this means that he's harmless now, but the doctor says no. The symbiote is still in his bloodstream. Cletus is still the alien's host, which means the symbiote is in full control. And Carnage is more dangerous than ever. Since returning back to New York, Flash spends his time sparring with his somewhat kinda new girlfriend and fellow Avenger Valkyrie. Though Flash seems to be holding his own against a Norse goddess as he throws her to the ground. Valkyrie tells him that that's a nice trick that he can do and then her hands begin to glow. With a quick slice, she summons her sword and cuts through Flash's symbiote legs, telling him that the rules of fighting can change at a moment's warning. As Flash falls back, he tells her that that was cheating. You can't summon a sword from thin air. She crawls on top of him, stating, maybe she should just make it up to him. But before she can give him a kiss, Flash's phone begins to ring. He webs over to it and he tells Katie that whatever it is, it better be important. And she tells him that she's over in Philadelphia working on a story that he might be interested in. As she picks the lock to a door, it swings open and Vapor says to Vector that she thought that this place was supposed to be secure. X-Ray says actually he's a bit more concerned as to who she's talking to. But Vector tells him not to worry. She doesn't know anything to tell anyone. 
After hearing Katie being abducted, Flash quickly heads over to Philadelphia to figure out what happened. He tracked down Katie's motel room through her editors, and he began his investigation. And as he enters her room, he finds newspaper articles on something called Project Rainbow. Something that has this ability to make things vanish. As he reads through the article, the entire room begins to catch fire, including Katie's work. Flash jumps out of the door and he sees the UFOs burning the building to the ground. And he tells them that he remembers them. Guess he made it to the superhero big leagues now. X-Ray says that he knew that reporter was talking to someone. As Ironclad attacks, he tells everyone to make sure that they leave nothing left of the reporter's research. And Flash begins to think about how the last time he ran into these guys, he almost died. And that was when he had backup. He kicks Ironclad away and then he jumps onto his head. And Ironclad says that that judo crap isn't going to slow him down. And just as Flash jumps away, he tells them that he knows. He just wanted to see how well his head holds up while there's a grenade strapped to it. The grenade explodes as Ironclad begins to yell because, you know, a grenade went off on his head. And then Vapor flies through releasing a poisonous gas. The symbiote begins to filter out the gas, allowing Flash to breathe. And he tells Vapor that that sort of thing really isn't going to help them. But while Flash is fighting with Vapor, X-Ray and the rest of them begin firing down on the motel. Flash swings through, grabbing any survivors that he can. And just as they begin to run, X-Ray fires a blast, cutting through some. Ironclad then starts crushing the ones that escaped the building. And Vapor infects the rest of them with his gas. Vapor tells X-Ray that Venom isn't jumping around anymore. Nuke him. X-Ray turns and blasts Flash, burning away the symbiote and then his skin. Meanwhile, an empty warehouse begins to have things appear out of thin air, including Katie strapped to a chair. She shouts that whatever it is they're doing, it doesn't scare her. And Vector tells her that she may not be scared, but they certainly are, or were, whichever the case may be. She looks around to see the other people strapped to chairs, mostly dead. Vector then tells her that there's nothing wrong with fear. They still have a lot of equipment to test. So how about they see what this thing can do to her pretty little face? Meanwhile, back at the motel, Flash lays on the burning rubble, opening his eyes. He stands up as the symbiote begins to retract and return, and he thinks about how the mimicry surprisingly worked out well. Back at the warehouse, Katie says that someone is going to come looking for her, and Vector tells her that he knows all about her and her identities that she uses for her stories, but he doubts that anyone would actually come looking for her. She then tells him that he better hope that this machine doesn't give her superpowers, because as soon as she gets out of this chair, Vector says that he's been running dozens of tests since they found this location. There isn't really any worry about positive side effects. She then asks what he's been doing, abducting people so that he can play alien doctor with all of this bizarre technology. And he tells her that once they found this warehouse and figured out the transduction equipment, they managed to put together some workers. But it's time for them to go ahead with their experiment. An orb in front of Katie begins to glow and visions of Katie's past start to appear within it. Vector says that she's lucky the machine didn't kill her, but it seems that there is some kind of memory machine dredging up her old secrets. Let's see what happens when someone is overexposed to that. After following a few leads, Flash tracks down a warehouse where the things mysteriously have been vanishing. As he scouts the area, he notices small orbs floating around and watching him. Back in the warehouse, some of the guards mention Venom's outside. Vector then tells X-Ray that he thought that Venom was dead. Maybe they should just bring him inside. Vector holds out his arm, and Flash suddenly begins to materialize. And he looks around, telling everyone, Hey. He pulls out his gun and sword, telling everyone that they should just skip the fighting and go straight to the surrendering part. X-Ray flies down, asking, what is the sword going to do to them? And in response to that, Flash throws the sword, and it pierces through X-Ray. He then tells him that the sword belongs to a friend of his, and it's not really part of this world. As the sword hits one of the crates behind X-Ray, he says the sword acts like a beacon too. And as the light begins to shine, Valkyrie rides in, and Flash tells everyone to meet his backup, or in this case, his girlfriend. She stops and asks, girlfriend? And Flash responds very quickly, saving his butt. Okay, saying that might have been a little awkward. Valkyrie begins fighting off the UFOs while Flash takes out the guards under Vector's control. But while they fight, Valkyrie says that they need to hurry and get the hostages out of there. Flash tells her that there's a dozen of them. There's no way that he can get them all out before they get dogpiled. As Valkyrie grabs her sword, she says maybe coming here was a bit implosive. And Flash says recklessness is a gift, you know. Vector tells him that he's had enough and fires a blast, knocking both Valkyrie and Flash away. Flash tries to get up stating that he can't do this, but then a voice tells him. No, he can't, but he can. And the demon inside of the Venom symbiote begins to take over. The demon Venom jumps up, shooting tendrils at all of the guards. Vector tells everyone to focus their power and slaughter that man. Ironclad says that he may have broke something in Venom's head with that last blast. And Vector says that he doesn't care. That guy is just Spider-Man in a monster mask. And we're the damn UFOs. More guards begin to appear, firing away at Venom. But as he jumps around, more of his tendrils shoot out, grabbing them. And soon the firing turns to the UFOs. X-Ray 
Valkyrie asks what is happening to everyone, and Vector tells him that it's Venom. He's controlling them! Valkyrie gets up looking around asking, what sort of deviltry is this? And Venom says that he's a little preoccupied at the moment, but she should stick around. He's been feeling a little pent up lately! Valkyrie rides back into the fight, telling him that that is profoundly creepy. She rides over to the machine, holding Katie, and tells her that she's no scientist, but she hopes smashing this device won't do any harm towards Katie. While the guards continue to fire at the UFOs, Venom says that he hopes that they don't mind him commandeering all of the weapons. And if it makes them feel better, the guards didn't like them to begin with. Once Katie gets free of the machine, she goes around helping the rest of the people and tells Valkyrie that it's nice that they can free everyone. But aren't they kind of surrounded by an interdimensional force field? Valkyrie cuts a hole in the portal to the outside, stating, You were saying? Back with Venom, X-Ray begins to blast away at Venom while Ironclad grabs a hold of him, telling him that he's about to feel a little pain. But as Ironclad begins to choke him, Venom, the demon Venom, says that he doesn't have to be tough. He just needs to be smarter. Ironclad looks over and sees the guards working and activating some of the machines. Vector calls out, stating that they're trying to activate the transduction equipment. But before they can stop them, the UFOs then all begin to dematerialize. Outside of the warehouse, Valkyrie and Katie wait for Flash to come out. And within moments, light begins to shine as Flash steps out of the portal. Valkyrie asks if it's the real him, and Flash tells her that the guy who doesn't want to be microwaved? Yeah, that's him. So Katie asks him, where are the UFOs? He tells her that he's not sure, but he's guessing he sent them packing. A short while later, Flash stands on a rooftop telling Valkyrie and Katie that he doesn't remember anything about what just happened. Valkyrie says that she's pretty sure that those people don't care what saved them, because if he hadn't shown up, they would all be dead. Katie brings up that he needs to be there sooner next time, and Valkyrie adds that as long as she's known him, he's wanted to be a hero, and perhaps tonight he proved it. But Flash tells her sure, but he's going to be doing it alone, isn't he? It's not like they stuck around long after the fight. Hell, right now, he's just talking to symbiote puppets. Both Valkyrie and Katie's heads begin to change shape, and they retract back into the suit. He tells them good talk, because he's actually been talking to himself. As he looks out over the city, he says that he's just a man with a symbiote and a demon. But sooner or later, they're all going to have to have a little chat. Meanwhile, over in Brooklyn, officers arrive in an apartment where there have been reports of a strange odor coming from the inside. They burst into the home, and as they look, they see bodies mutilated and piled up inside of the middle of the room. One officer aims her flashlight up, and she says, what the hell is that? And a body tangled up in vain says, don't worry. These guys were all criminals and gang members, so you can thank me later, unless you want to put me on the payroll. The woman shouts that it's Eddie Brock, it's Venom, but Eddie tells her, you got it all wrong. These days, I like to be called Toxin! With everything that was happening in Flash's life, he decided that it might be best to have a different view on the world and move to Philadelphia. But as the movers finish dropping off the last of his boxes, he begins to hear one of his new neighbors shout for them to keep it down. He heads out to tell the neighbor that he's sorry he had just moved in. The man doesn't care. He just needs to get some sleep because some people work at night. As the man slams his door shut, Flash says that it's good to meet him too. And then a girl's voice asks if he's the new guy. Flash looks back and the girl tells him not to worry about Mr. Fricks over there. He's normally yelling about not getting to work on time, which he never does anyway. Flash tells her thanks for the tip and then he asks if she goes to West Philly because he just got hired at the PE department. The girl looks at him and tells him, whatever, she's got places to be. And in response to that, Flash tells himself, look at that. I'm making friends already. As the night begins to fall in the city, it's time for Flash to go out and do some good around the town. Because that's what honest to goodness superheroes do. They patrol the streets and they stop crime, which is still boring as hell. As the patrol goes on, Flash spots a man who left a bar after a woman had turned him down. As the woman walks down past the corner, she sees Flash hanging there with the man, telling her that she might want to make it home quick. After swinging and dropping the man off, Flash lets Venom take over to scare the man for a bit. And he tells him that if he wants to live, he's gonna go turn himself in. And if he catches him out here again, well, you know. The man runs off screaming for the police, and the Venom just says, Nom, nom, nom. A little while later, off in another alley, a street gang corners a young boy, telling him that his cousin runs for them. There ain't nothing changing that. And the boy Rafe says that his cousin Enzo can do whatever he wants, but he himself does not want to join their little gang. The gang leader says that no one said that he could even join them, but they're both still going to work for them. Members of the gang begin to grab onto Rafe, and as the leader grabs Enzo, a shadow begins to float behind them. A voice calls out, that's enough. The chains then begin whipping around, knocking all of the thugs down, and the figure appears before them, telling them that her name is Hail Mary, the mother superior of punishment. All of the thugs look at her, and then they begin to run. Once alone, Flash begins to revert back into his Venom suit, laughing that that was a good one. And the next morning, he wakes up to look at the medicine the Beast has been giving him to help him keep the symbiote in check and under control. As Flash puts the needle down, he tells himself that he won't use this unless he needs to. So far, he's been able to control Venom with very little problems. And now it's time to finally get some rest. A little while later, he wakes up from his nap with the sounds of a knock on his door. 
He hurries and answers it, and two police officers state that they're sorry for waking him up so early, but they wanted to ask if he had heard any disturbances in the last couple of hours. Flash tells them no. Seems like he's a pretty heavy sleeper. The officers tell him that it seems like his neighbor, Robert Fricks, has been the victim of a home invasion and he's been hospitalized, and it might be a while before he regains consciousness. Flash responds with he's sorry he couldn't be of any help to them, and then he asks himself if he did that. And then he says that he already knows the answer to that. Meanwhile, back in New York at Flash's old apartment, a man knocks on the door asking for Flash to hurry and open up. An older woman walks by stating that Flash has started a new job over in Philadelphia, so he's not there anymore. And the man pulls down his hood, and Eddie Brock says, Oh, that's too bad. I just hate it when Flash skips town like that. After getting cleaned up, Flash gets ready to start his first day of work, but before leaving, he tries to call Katie since she's the only real friend that he has left these days. But just as the many times before, it goes right to voicemail. Before leaving, Flash grabs Beast's medicine to bring with him just in case. Even with what happened to Mr. Fricks, he still feels like he's in control and hung over even though he hasn't had a drink in a long time. Later at West Philadelphia High, Coach Yates introduces Flash as a new assistant coach joining their staff. One of the kids whispers what's he supposed to coach, the Special Olympics? And Coach Yates tells them that he expects them all to show Coach Thompson here the same respect that they show him. Yates then blows the whistle to run drills and as the students run, Flash notices one of the boys that he rescued the other night. As he looks around, he then sees the girl from his apartment and he says hello, though he never caught her name. She says that her name is Andy and knows she will not be dressing up for PE today. As the day ends, Flash heads back to his other job, being a superhero patrolling the streets of Philly. And while out, he notices one strange man and decides to keep watch on him. The hunchback man heads into an apartment building, grumbling to himself as he takes off his overcoat, showing four canisters on his back. He then begins eating the dog food that he brought, stating that he's just so hungry, but this isn't working. He walks to the tied up family, telling them that he's sorry, please forgive him. And suddenly Flash jumps down, tackling the man, telling him that he should give the family a little space. Flash tells the family to hang on so he can get him out of there, and the man says that he can't do that, he needs them. Flash pulls out his gun, and the man's body begins to rip and tear, exposing metal limbs. And he pins Flash down, telling him that he's so sorry for this. But before the man can bite into Flash, Venom's tendrils reach out, pulling the man off of him, and Flash tells him, I think I know a thing or two about being hungry myself. I just gotta keep it in check. Flash then rolls to grab his gun, and he aims it back at the man, but the man is already gone. Outside, the man walks through the streets looking for something to eat, and then he spots another man sitting in an alley. He tells himself that they have something in common. They've both made mistakes. And Eddie Brock turns, stating, I was tracking a friend, but it seems like his stink is all over you. And then Toxin takes over, another symbiote, and he says, It seems like we both picked the wrong guy! Ha! Toxin grabs onto the man, and he throws him to the side, and as the man lands, the canisters on his back begin to wind up. More skin tears away, and he says, He doesn't want to kill the man, but they won't let him Stop! Toxin tells him, That's good for whoever that is, because I want to fight! The man lunges at Toxin, and Toxin punches him away. He then gets back up, jumping away, ripping Toxin off of Eddie, telling him that they can't be stopped. The adaptation matrix is in their blood. Toxin grabs onto one of the man's mechanical arms and tears it off, and then he holds him up over his head. Toxin says, I'm just gonna get one more freak off the streets! And the man's stomach begins to twist and turn, and two metal spikes shoot out of him, and they wrap around, stabbing Toxin in the chest. Toxin throws the man off, telling himself, I've gotta go heal now. And as Toxin struggles to heal, he looks back to see the man gone and shouts, You better run! Now it's time to get back to the bait and hook. With the sun rising, Flash heads back to his apartment to speak with Beast regarding the man that he ran into the other night. Flash tells him that he thinks the man is infected with something, some kind of alien technology. Beast says looking over the reports from the encounter with the UFOs, it's possible that he could have been infected by them. Though it's a long shot, they may be able to help him. That is, if the man can be brought to them. Flash tells him that he just needs to catch a flesh-eating monster and bring him back? No problem. He'll get right on that. Later that night, back at the local kennel, the last worker begins to hear the dogs barking at something. As she walks to go check on them, she sees blood everywhere, and the man looks up, stating, I'm sorry, I had to feed. He then looks at the woman and says, I still have to feed, and he chases after her. As the woman runs outside, the man follows close behind, and then he stops as Flash webs him up and throws him into a car. The Venom suit starts to assemble his gun, and Flash tells him that he doesn't want to shoot him. He can help if he lets him. And the man says, I may want your help, but it's too late. Flash fully webs up the man, stating, Fine, call my bluff for not shooting you. And as Flash stares, he begins to wonder if killing him would be. But then Toxin's voice tells him, Mercy killing! 
from the shadows. Toxin jumps out, stating, I think the man should be put out of his misery. So I'll take care of him, and then we can fight! As Toxin gets closer, he slashes away at Flash's chest, ripping through the suit and into Flash Thompson's chest. He then stands over Flash, telling him, You may want to pray now! But Flash whips his arm back, smacking Toxin away. Flash tries to crawl away so he can let the wound heal, but Toxin jumps back onto a car, slamming it down next to him. Toxin rips the car in half, and he begins walking towards Flash, and Flash opens fire! But the bullets do nothing against Toxin's skin, and he just laughs. <laughs> Through the pain, Flash jumps up, kicking Toxin in the head, and just as his foot connects, Toxin thrusts his arm out, stabbing into Flash's head. Flash falls back, unable to see as the blood covers his eyes, and then he hears a screeching yell. Both look up to see the man from before jumping at them, and Toxin quickly stabs into Flash and then stabs through the man. As Toxin pulls back, he holds up the man and he starts to open up his mouth. Flash begins to shout, STOP! And then one of Toxin's tendrils whips around, throwing him back to the ground. And Toxin tells him, I admire what you're trying, but you're no hero. Sooner or later, you won't be able to help yourself. And that's when you will die. Toxin widens his mouth and chomp. As the man's body falls to the ground, Toxin turns back, asking, Now where were we? Flash jumps forward, letting Venom shoot out, shouting, You didn't have to kill him! A second chomp can be heard, and then one of Toxin's arms flies off. Toxin gets back up, telling him, Yes, I did! And he grabs onto Venom's head, and as Venom's tongue whips out, it cuts off Toxin's claws. Toxin pulls back, screaming, and then he towers over Venom, and he bites onto him. Then with one quick jerk, Toxin throws Venom into the air, and he begins to regenerate himself. Venom jumps back up and charges back in to continue this battle, but Toxin grabs him by the head and stabs him through the chest. While Toxin is holding Venom's body up, one of Venom's tendrils crawls out with a needle and stabs it in the toxin, the needle that contains the medicine. Toxin throws him down, shouting, What did you do? And he slowly begins to retract off of Eddie Brock. Flash taking over starts to crawl away, and Eddie shouts, We're not done. I'm gonna teach you a lesson and show you just how dangerous a monster can be. A little while later, Andy sits on top of her apartment building when she suddenly hears a loud thud. She looks back to see Flash crawling out of the shadows. She runs over to ask what happened, and Flash tells her, I'll, I'll be all right. And Andy tells him, no way, you look like... But then Flash shouts, telling her, leave me alone! She gets up telling him sorry for trying to help. Hopefully he doesn't rot up here. And as he lays back down, he tells himself he can't let people get close. That's why he left New York and Betty. Meanwhile, in another part of town, a homeless man kicks over another homeless man, telling him, you ate the last of the baloney, didn't you? And as the second man turns back, he sees metal spikes crawling out of his mouth. The homeless man stumbles into another man, but then sees the same thing. The machines start crawling out and affecting new hosts, all reciting that their targets are venom and toxin. The next day at school, the students all begin to look at Flash, and he already knows why. The fight with Eddie and Toxin left a nice shiner on his face, and all of the students want to know how it happened. But just as he begins to think about Eddie, he sees Eddie through the crowd at his school, full of students. Eddie walks right up to Flash and tells him, It wasn't very hard to find you. I was a reporter before. Flash tells him that this isn't happening, not here. Here. And Eddie tells him, this is happening. We will finish what we started. We're gonna walk out there, go somewhere isolated, and end this. Flash looks up asking, and if I tell you to go screw yourself? Eddie leans down and tells him, then I'll release Toxin right here and now. The two argue whether they're going to fight, but then Eddie smells something. And Flash asks him, what is it? Eddie tells him it's oil and blood, chemicals and rot, just like that alien freak from the other night. Suddenly there's a scream and everyone looks back to see more of those infected people grabbing onto the teachers. The students begin to run, but the infected people walk down the hallways killing anyone that they can grab. Flash looks back at Eddie and asks, Are we gonna do this? We can't let the students get hurt. And if you want to kill me, fine, but after we save these kids. Flash then starts directing all of the kids into a room and Andy asks him, What about you? And he tells her, don't worry, I won't let anything happen to you. As Flash takes off and Venom crawls out, he asks Eddie, do we have a deal? And Eddie tells him, fine, we can kill each other later. The infected roam the halls looking for Venom and Toxin, and Toxin jumps in, biting away at one of them. He tells the other infected, don't worry, I won't leave you out of this! Venom then starts crawling into the duct while slamming some of the infected around. But as Toxin is left alone, the infected begin ganging up, tearing Toxin down. Just as they're getting ready to kill them, Toxin shouts, I will kill every last one of you! And then there's a sound of cracking coming straight towards them, as Venom bursts out of the ground shouting for them, Get off! Venom gets out and he starts running through the infected, tearing them apart. And once Toxin regenerates, he then jumps in, killing off the remaining stragglers. Venom says, I saved your hide, huh? And Toxin asks him, are you ready for what's next? Venom shouts, do you really want to do this? And Toxin tells him, yeah, I know what it was like to wear Venom. I couldn't control it. Venom then slowly reverts back into his suit. And Flash tells him, I can control it. 
because I have to. Toxin leans in and tells him, Okay. And Flash asks, What? But Toxin goes on stating, I'll be watching you. Then when you lose control, I will come back and kill you. Flash looks at him and tells him, If that ever happens, I want you to kill me. Eddie reverts back, stating, It won't be an if, it'll be a when. A little while later, the police arrive and the students are all released from the school. As Flash leaves, a reporter runs over asking, What exactly happened in there? And Flash says that he's not sure he has much to say. He was locked away in the supply closet, but he did see some creature. Even though it was brief, it was red and black and covered in something like pasta. But it single-handedly fought off those killer cyborgs or whatever they are and then just took off. It's good knowing that there's someone like that out there and elsewhere in the city. One of those machines crawls out of the ground and skitters away. Since the run-in with Eddie, Flash has returned to his normal life. PE coach during the day, stopping crimes at night, and occasionally, he goes to his AA meetings. Day after day, it's the same thing, until one Sunday night, Flash begins to notice something. While taking down some drug dealers in their meth lab, one of them pulled out a gun and was ready to fire. Before he could pull the trigger, Flash jumped on top of the man, telling him that pointing a gun at someone surrounded by a ton of chemicals really is a bad idea. He then goes on to state that someone as dumb as him clearly isn't calling the shots, so he's gonna need some information. The next morning during class, Flash watches as the kids begin their dodgeball practice, but then he notices Andy, the young girl living in his apartment complex, still not dressing up for P.E. He calls her out telling her that if she isn't going to make an effort to dress out, she could at least put away her phone during the class. Andy tells him whatever as she puts her phone away. Dodgeball is so educational. But out on the court, Flash watches as one of his jock students begins to pick on some of the weaker students, making fun of them. As the student laughs, Flash looks at him thinking how he used to be like that, always picking on the weaker students, so he decides that maybe he should take him down a peg or two. He grabs one of the dodgeballs, and using venom, he throws it with such a force that it knocks the kid down and across the court. Now, all he has to do is play it cool. This shouldn't be a problem so long as no one saw him throw it, except Andy did see him throw it, and Flash knows that she did. Later that night, he follows up on some leads that he got from the night before with the drug runners. He attempts to stop another group of runners on their way back to see their boss, Lord Ogre. But while trying to stop the van, the runners slam on the brakes, throwing Flash off. As the runners escape, Flash tries to figure out how he's going to catch up now, and then he sees an old broken down car next to him. A short while later at Ogre's hideout, the runners pull up and begin to unload as they suddenly hear an engine revving up. Through the garage door, Flash charges in in his Venom Mobile. He jumps through the window, slamming down two of the runners into the ground, and the rest open fire on him. After taking down a couple more of the runners, one manages to shoot Flash in the head, blowing part of it off. Flash stumbles back while Venom repairs his head, and then he spits out the bullet, telling the shooter, he will do it. Venom's mouth begins to open as his tongue creeps out, licking the man's face, and he asks, where could I find your boss? A voice then calls out, stating, right here, and Flash sees Lord Ogre. Ogre says that if he's coming looking for him instead of busting up his business, he should have called for a meeting. Flash tells him that from the looks of it, he's kind of ruined his business, so this will now be the part where he takes him down. The man that Flash is holding begins to tell Ogre that he never would have sold him out. He knows that, right? And Ogre tells him, of course, he was always a good apostle. He lets go of the chains on the two dogs that he's holding, and they charge towards Flash and the runners. One jumps on the runner while Flash grabs the other and throws it into the first dog, knocking them away. He quickly pulls out his guns, and as he takes aim, he sees Ogre has already escaped. Flash tells himself that he couldn't have gotten far, he should be able to, and then he hears a thump coming from a van. He heads over to the van, ready to take down the runners who decided to hide in there, and that's when he sees a van full of people. So not only was Ogre doing the drug business, but he was also in the human trafficking game. There's only one way to deal with a monster like that. The next morning, Flash heads back to work when a voice calls out, Venom. Flash turns back to see Katie and asks how, but before he can ask that, she tells him, You're Flash Thompson, right? You were here when Venom showed up. He tells himself just to play it cool, she doesn't know who he really is, and tells her that he didn't really get a good look at him, so he doesn't have much to say. Katie says that that's too bad, but here's her card in case anyone happens to know anything. Later that night, after taking on more of Ogre's men, Flash begins to think about how messed up it is that he hasn't heard from Katie in weeks, and now she's trying to get information out of him? What is she trying to do? Get her next big story? That wasn't part of their deal. After taking down some more of the thugs, Flash tells the kidnapped people to get out of here. He's got some questions that he needs answering without them seeing. Venom's mouth begins to open up wide, and it wraps its tongue around the thug's neck, asking, Where can I find Lord Ogre? But before the man can answer, he passes out, and more thugs appear, opening fire on Venom. The men are no match for Flash, until he's cracked across the head with a shield. Flash begins to ask if it could be Captain America, but then he sees that it's not Cap. It's some guy called Death Shield. Death Shield tells Jagged Bow to take his shot so that they can hurry and cash their checks, and Flash tells him that it's normally a bad idea to try and act like heroes. He jumps away, and Jagged Bow releases his arrows, hitting Flash 
splash, and then they emit a sonic shock. The shock pulls Venom apart, and then the one called Blood Spider jumps in punching. Flash tells him that there's only one knockoff wall crawler in this city, and that's me! Venom starts to take over and knocks him away, but before he can land the final blow, Death Shield charges and slamming into Flash. Venom gets back up and grabs Death Shield, throwing him into Jagged Bow. He then makes his way to the three of them, and suddenly a wire shoots out, grabbing Flash around the neck and electrocuting him. The wire's coming from Constrictor, and with him is Mr. Deathstrike, or Lord Deathstrike, something with death in it. Constrictor continues shocking Flash, and Jagged Bow shouts that Venom was their target! Constrictor tells him no, he's been tracking this for a while. Venom belongs to him! Deathstrike then cuts the wires around Flash, and soon all of the mercenaries begin to fight each other. But before they can realize that Flash has escaped. While swinging through the city, Flash begins to think that with this much muscle under Ogre's payroll, he's gonna have to make a call. He's gonna need some intel. A little while later, in an underground parking lot, Katie says, It's like that first time when they met, isn't it? Flash tells her that he knows that she's trying to dig up dirt on him. He thought that they had an understanding. And Katie says that they do. But she also has bosses. Who would he rather have poking around at his business? Her or a random reporter? Lucky for him, she's got all of the reasons resources that he needs. Meanwhile, over at Ogre's penthouse, he welcomes all of the mercenaries who have been gathered regarding the hit that he has put out on Venom. He tells them that he knows that it might be overkill to have so many, but that's what he wants. Overkill sends a message! A voice then tells him that he happens to be singing his tune with that, and Jack flies down telling him, I'm sorry that I'm a bit late. I've had some troubles getting a hall pass. With Katie's help, Flash begins gathering resources, making allies, while taking down Ogre's hitmen one by one. However, while Flash slowly takes out some of the hitmen, Jack continues to watch from the shadows, waiting for his next move. Back in the apartment building, Andy sits with her father as the two of them watch TV. But after thinking it over for a little while, she begins to feel how this might be the time to finally talk to Flash about what she saw. She heads downstairs and knocks on Flash's door, asking if he has a few minutes to talk, and the door swings open, and Jack says, I'm afraid Eugene isn't home right now, but I'm actually a really good listener myself. Jack says that he actually should just leave a message for their crippled friend, and use her blood to do so. Andy begins running back upstairs, and Jack and his dolls stay close behind her. She runs back into her apartment and tells her dad to call 911. Call anyone! But before either of them can move, Jack bursts through the door yelling, Yahoo! Andy's father tells her to try and get to the fire escape. He'll do what he can. But that's when Flash jumps in, tackling Jack, telling him to stay away from them. Flash knows that if Jack can break out once, he can break out again and again. So this time, he's gonna put him down once and for all. But before he can shoot, Jack says that he would like to say something in his defense. And then he starts spinning a fire! Flash stumbles and Jack jumps up, cutting away at Flash's stomach. But as Jack Jack gets up ready to swing again. Andy's father runs in, pushing Jack away. Jack hits him on the head and starts to walk towards him. And Flash tries to hold him back, but Jack reaches out and stabs Andy's father in the chest. Flash screams and Venom takes over, shouting, I will kill you! Jack throws down sets of teeth to slow down Flash, and he tells him that he wasn't in it for the money, really. Since he will get some, maybe he can donate it to his orphan's fund. Jack then throws gas bombs at Andy and tells her to catch. But rather than going after Jack, Flash releases some of the Venom to cover Andy's face to protect her from the gas. But something else happened, and now Andy is wearing a Venom suit. Andy starts to look at herself in her new Venom suit, asking, what just happened? And Jack tells Flash that he's pretty sure she's talking to him. Andy looks down at the wrench that her father was using to protect her and grabs it, shouting that she will kill him! She cracks the wrench across Jack's pumpkin, spinning it around, and the dolls shout, you're mean! Andy then tears through the dolls just as Jack turns his head back and he sees Flash charging towards him. Once Flash gets close enough, he punches Jack across the room and Andy follows up, knocking him through the wall. Andy then grabs Jack, ready to kill him, but Flash grabs her, telling her to stop. She shouts for him to let her go. Let her kill the man that killed her father! And Jack stands back up, with the pumpkin cracked and chipping away. Flash sees that it's not Jack at all. Flash grabs him, asking who is he and how did he know about him? And the man smiles, telling him, you can never run far enough. No matter what, we are Jack and we are everywhere! Just a few weeks ago, I was a nobody. That was until I stumbled upon a storage unit that happened to belong to Jack. I went inside and I changed, and Jack Jack's mind took over. Andy gets back up, stating that she doesn't care, she's heard enough, and Flash stops her, stating that this man is just as much of a victim as she is. He gets up, stating that, that's right, he was forced into his little predicament, just like she was, and now it's time for him to go. The man hops on his broom, and he takes off, and Flash and Andy follow right behind. As Flash stops, he asks himself if he should really just kill this man, and Andy shouts for him to wait up. Flash tells her that he can't let her come, and Andy says that the guy just killed her father. There's no way that he's gonna stop her now. Flash looks at her and says, yes, he can, and he holds his arm out to call that symbiote back. Back. Except, it's not returning. The bond shouldn't be so permanent. Andy leans in and tells him, Whatever you just tried to do, don't ever do that again. Now get out of her way. 
As Andy swings off, Flash watches in amazement at how well Andy is adapting to her new powers. It's as if she's a natural. As Andy gets ahead, an explosion goes off, knocking her to the ground. Jack, with the other mercenaries, step out, stating that that's not Venom, it's just a kid! And Constrictor says that he doesn't care who anyone works for. No one is killing a kid! Jack says that that's nice and all, but he should have told him that. And then Flash swings at kicking Constrictor down! Together, Flash and Andy fight off the mercenaries until it's just Jack left. After Flash knocks him down, Andy picks Jack back up and slowly begins to crush his head. And Flash tells her not to do this. If she goes down this path, there's no coming back. Andy shouts that he's the one who did this to her. Why would he give her this power if he didn't want her to use it? Flash says that he's just trying to protect her. If he could take the symbiote back, he would, but there's something that's wrong. They need to get through this together. And if she kills him now, she'll be on her own. So make the right choice. Sirens begin to go off in the distance, and the police arrive to see all of the mercenaries webbed up. As the days pass, Flash tries to get things back to normal, but the fact is, it can't go back to normal. After the funeral, Andy moved in with her aunt, and her and Flash have kept in contact. But with everything happening, there's just so many questions that need to be answered. How did the symbiote spawn another one like that? How did Andy get so used to the suit so quickly? There's one person that he can ask, and right now, he's not talking. Flash, life hasn't been very simple with his two new jobs. The first involves him fighting alongside the Guardians of the Galaxy. The second, though, being an agent of the Cosmos, is a little more complicated. In the current times, Flash begins to rip apart giant alien crabs, and 803 radios down, telling him that he's not sure why they stopped on this wreck of a planet anyway. After stabbing into another crab, Flash tells him that he heard a cry for help in his head again. And as that last crab is destroyed, the native aliens all praise Flash for his help. But before long, it begins to rain, and one of the aliens says that it's heat rain. It burns! Flash quickly expands the Venom symbiote to create a giant bubble and asks the alien where is their village. One mentions that it's down the river, so Flash pushes the bubble into the river and lets it float on. Inside the bubble, Flash says that he heard someone calling for help. What exactly is going on here? Another alien says that the Forma are normally docile creatures, but since the drill came and took away their food, they've been attacking everyone. Flash asks, what drill? And as they get to the village, the alien leads him to a rock ledge. Down in the valley, they see a giant mechanical drill, and the alien says that he's not sure why it's here, but there's no one in it, and every so often, green canisters fly into the sky filled with the Forma's food. Flash tells him he's got this, and he radios over to Ada 3. Seconds later, Flash's ship swoops down from space and blasts the drill, destroying it. As Flash gets on board, the aliens all praise him for his help, calling him a god. He sits down at the command seat, and 803 asks if he's a god now, and Flash responds, telling him just to get them out of there. 803 tells him right away, Oh, by the way, we may be trapped. Outside, the ship is a giant war cruiser. Before they can fly back to the planet, the cruiser begins to pull them in with a tractor beam. And as the ship docks, Flash hops out and begins to search, and then he calls out that he knows someone's there. An alien jumps down screaming and swinging at Flash, but Flash dodges them and moves away. The alien begins to move in for a second attack, but Flash reaches out grabbing a pipe, asking if they like baseball. With no answer, he cracks the alien in the head, telling him that he guesses not. As the alien stumbles back, Flash calls out that he's pretty sure Clintar are supposed to be peaceful, so he's going to assume that they've got a real nasty piece of work underneath that symbiote. The alien begins to change its arms into blades and tells him, You have no idea! The alien lunges forward, and then a voice calls out, telling them all it's enough. Another Clintar steps out, explaining that his name is Mintril, and her name is Tarna. And like him, they are agents of the cosmos. Tarna shouts that he can't be one of them, he's too weak! Barely in sync with his Clintar! And Flash says they may have been getting along pretty well, since they've been cleansed and things are going well with them. Aside from the voices in his head now, Minstrel tells him that they're not voices, that is the cosmos, and it is their job to answer it. He goes on saying that they have been testing him to see if he's worthy, and he's done rather exceptionally. Tarna adds, adequate, that's best! And Flash says that we're all going to be best friends now, aren't we? As Tarna leaves saying he's just a waste of time, Flash tells Mintrill that he was just on a planet that was being tapped for fuel with some intense tech. Know anything about it? And Mintrill tells him no, but it is possible that the Rogue may be the same person whose chemical weapons they've been intercepting. Flash boards his ship and asks if it's all connected, and Mintrill says yes. That's why they need him, to find out who's behind all of this. As he leaves, Mintrill adds that Tarna is in charge of training. So if he needs her, just call. She will most definitely probably not answer. 
Elsewhere on the barren planet, reports begin to come in that they have a lock on the ship that destroyed the drill. One of the aliens asks Lord Mercio for his orders, and he tells them to find their most vile creature in the holding cells and have them follow this so-called Venom. Flash continues his travels, stopping by many planets, helping those in need. And just as he finishes up on the last one and decides that it's time for a break, he gets into the call. He says hopefully it's a place where people like high fives or something. And so he flies down to see a volcanic planet with lava flowing everywhere, and he says a giant planet of lava and fire also works, he guesses. 803 mentions that since Clintars are vulnerable to fire, they do have some rumble suits in the back that might help him get on the planet. Flash gets into one of the suits and grabs a rifle, realizing that this will probably work. 803 stops him, telling him, actually, the planet's atmosphere is too volatile to allow gunfire, so you would need to go with this crude weapon instead. Flash looks at the chest and happily tells 803 to open the pod. He's got himself a sword! Seconds later, Flash jumps out of the ship, landing in a river of lava, and 803 radios that he only has 30 minutes in that suit down there. He notices a woman running towards him, and he radios back to hang on. He's about to be ambushed, but the alien calls out in her native language, and the suit begins to translate, and what she's saying is that he will bow before her, Inca, Queen of the Wugget. Flash defends himself, telling her that he missed the first part there, but either way, his name is Flash Thompson. Nice to meet her. Inca swings away, saying that he speaks their word, Flash Thompson. He is one of the Ursippers who have come to destroy their world. As Flash holds his arm out, he tells her that he's not one of the Ursippers. Actually, he's there to help. Any chance that she can take him to the Ursippers? Inca steps back and tells him, fine, she will take him there. But any false movements and she will eat his skull. And Flash tells her that that's fair. A short walk later, Inca points out to her warriors who are fighting the beings known as the Underdwellers who live inside of the Great Eye. Since something landed inside of the Great Volcano, the Underdwellers have been attacking, thinking that they are there to destroy their home, which all they want to do is help. Flash tells Inca that he needs to get up there so that he can get inside of the Great Eye and get this whole thing sorted out. And Inca says, fine, to the battle then! Along with the Wugan warriors, Flash fights his way through the Great Eye and 803 radios that he's pretty sure the suit won't handle much more, especially jumping into a pit of lava. Flash tells him that he's going to go radio silent for a bit, and 803 asks, if you don't return, do I at least have permission to fly into the nearest star? Flash leaps in and says, no, you have permission to live forever and write epic songs about me. As Flash swims through, he finds a device planted in the volcano's core and destroys it. He reaches his hand back out, and Inca grabs him and kisses him, telling him that he always has a place here in her husband's stable. Flash responds, telling her that he may have to take a rain check on that, and back up on his ship, he hops out of the rumble suit, telling himself he just kissed an alien. Totally didn't know that that was on his bucket list. Besides, that rumble suit worked like a charm. No sooner does he say that than the suit falls apart. 803 asks, you were saying. 803 then mentions, I have something that I would like to give you if you would be so kind as to head to the med bay. Flash heads over there asking what did he want to show him and 803 says that it is not a song. He has made him a pair of legs. A short while later, Flash sets himself up on the prosthetic legs and says that he's going to need a cane while he figures these things out. He then thanks 803 and realizes something and asks a very important question. Who's flying the ship? 803 brings Flash back to the control room and tells him that it's the Clintar. And Venom looks back telling Flash, It's probably time that we had a talk. Flash sits with Venom and he tells him that this is a little strange. And Venom responds with, Tell me about it. Flash asks how come he's never done this before, become a sentient being from himself. And Venom tells him that he couldn't. Not since he's been cleansed, but now here they are. Venom goes on, saying that he can hold this form for about an hour, but with practice he should be able to hold it for half an Earth day, allowing them to work as separate entities if needed. If you're still wondering what's going on, this all started when the Venom symbiote went back to its home world and learned that it was supposed to be a hero for the cosmos, someone to save people, and his original race, the Clintar, purged him of all of those evil thoughts and hatred that he was building up with. Anyway, Venom tells Flash that when they're joined, he can feel the cosmos better. They make great partners. Flash tells him it's nice to hear that. Speaking of, do you hear that humming? Just then, the ship is shot and begins to fall out of space as it crash lands down on a planet. Flash gets out, telling Venom that he appreciates him wrapping him up. And Venom tells him that he won't be able to communicate in this form, but he will always be here. Flash gets out, pulling some of the debris, and he calls out for 803, his droid that he rescued. Throwing the rubble aside, 803 says that he's here, but he's afraid that they may be under attack. Flash tells him, you don't say! And 803 goes on to say that he scanned the attacking ship. The only life form that he found on it was Peek Rolo, a vicious criminal. Flash turns around to see Peek and asks if he's sure that she is a criminal. And 803 says yes. She's wanted for murder, treason, and arson across 15 systems. She is a menace. But as Peek stands before them, Flash says, she's adorable! 
But just as he says that, Peek smacks him, shouting, Your head belongs to Mercurio. She grabs Ada 3 and starts to tear him apart as he yells, Sweet release 11100101. Flash jumps back in, punching, and as the two of them fight, Flash begins to rip off Peek's spacesuit, telling her that she hurt his friend, which pisses him off. And when he gets mad, his partner takes over. Venom takes over, and a small beam of light shoots in, hitting Flash and Peek, knocking them both out. An alien ship then flies down, and two robots step out, stating that they needed warm bodies for their mass. Their master will surely be pleased. As they are brought aboard the ship and placed in holding containers, Flash tells Peek that this is all her fault. You sad, sad panda. She responds, telling him that she is not a panda. She is a ruleto, and what she has experienced is not sadness. She feels only rage. Flash looks around at all the other aliens and containers and says that rage might come in handy, going where he thinks this is going to go. Soon, all of the prisoners are released into the arena, and the master robot shouts that their deaths at the hands of their battle beast shall be for nothing. And Flash shouts, he hates when he's right. He then turns to Peek and tells her that if they're going to live through this, he's going to have to kill her. And Peek responds with, you're welcome to try. Though, for what it's worth, I'm sorry. Mercurio has my child. Giant beasts begin to make their way into the arena, and the master robot shouts that they will teach him the ways of war. Once he's had enough, he will rule the universe. When the fighting begins, Peek explains that Mercurio is a Gromosin, which are normally peaceful. However, their planet requires vast quantities of energy to survive. And Mercurio went rogue. He now collects energy and weapons from all over the galaxy. One day, he raided their planet and kidnapped their greatest warriors, but since he extorted them into a criminal life, she's the only one that's left alive. As the bodies begin to fall, Flash says that he'll make her a deal. If they do survive this, she will take him to Mercio so that they can take him out together and save the kid. They both continue the fight and the bodies fall until there's only one person left. Venom. The master robot steps from his throne and calls out, At last, the great white bear has fallen. But as the master robot goes on, Flash begins to laugh. <laughs> Ah, the master robot says he does not know why he is laughing. Humor is not required. But from behind the master robot, Peek's shadow looms over and she rips the master robot's head off. All of the other robot guards rush down and surround them. And while you would assume that they are there to battle against them, they end up bowing and shouting, praise the new masters. Flash says, how about they all just go free? Declare themselves as their new masters. But another robot shouts, we live to serve. Tell us how to serve. So Flash follows up by telling them he's going to have to sleep on it. He has something that he needs to go check on. A little while later, Peek says that she's not sure why they're coming back here. And Flash says that he's not leaving his friend behind. But the sentence is stomped when Flash sees a fully repaired 803 and a fully repaired ship. He asks 803 what happened. And 803 says, sadly, he was not killed. So he put himself back together as well as the ship. Peek says that she's sorry that she nearly destroyed him. But 803 says that he only wished that she had finished the job. Once everyone gets on the ship, Flash says, all right, let's go rescue your kid. After their getaway, everyone meets in the weapons hangar, and Peek asks if this is really their only options. Flash says that this was their stealthiest of options. It will work! Probably. As her and Flash get ready, she tells them that if that was humor, it was unfortunately timed. Venom begins to cover the both of them, and Flash says they're going to get her kid back, as long as they survive this part. Outside of the ship, preparations to fire are set, and then the ship fires Venom shaped like a missile. The missile Venom orbits Mercio's planet and crashes down. And as Flash and Peek get out of the wreckage, she says that she prays to the gods that she'll never have to endure such a thing again. The two make their way to the base, but Flash begins to notice none of the guards are running to stop them. Peek tells them that he is less than intimidating and Flash says that's funny coming from a murderous space bear. But then they stop as the guards come out and Flash says that he vouched for her and Peek says that she's sorry. The guards grab onto Flash as he manages to punch at Peek. He struggles trying to fight as Peek hits him back stating that she had no choice. She had to protect her child. As the guards walk away leaving Flash on the ground, one says that it's time to give him the treatment. A sonic blast emits peeling off of Venom, leaving him as just a pile of goo. Mercio then walks out saying he finally gets to meet the man meddling in his affairs. Flash gets up charging towards Mercio, but he's easily knocked down. He picks himself back up and runs again, but this time Mercio takes out his sword, cutting the prosthetic legs off, telling him that he's nothing without his Clintar. He then raises the sword to kill Flash, but Peek tells him to wait. They need him alive for now. The Clintar is bonded to him. Until they can fix the Clintar, his plan would be for nothing. Flash crawls, shouting not to lay a hand on him, but Mercio kicks him down, knocking him out. The guards then pick up Flash's body, and Mercio tells them to take him to the pit. He examines the puddle that is Venom, and he tells Peek that she played her part well, perhaps a little 
too well? Peak lunges at Mercio, burying her claws, and without even getting up, Mercio releases an electronic pulse, shocking her. He continues beating down on her until more guards begin to drag her away, and as they do, he tells them to inform her that she will need to kill her friend or he will drown her child. A short while later, Peek is thrown into a pit alongside Flash, and as she lands, he tells her, look, he told her that it would work, and she says that if she was not broken right now, she would break him. However, back outside, Mercio begins to laugh as he is now bonded with Venom. Mercio tells Venom that he feels strange. They're not wearing each other. It's as if they are one and he can feel the hunger. However, he cannot fear it. He shall keep him well fed. Back down in the pit, Flash hears the door shift open and he says, right on schedule. As Mercio steps in, Flash asks, how bad is it? Peek says that it looks like this is going to be the end. Flash then says that he wasn't talking to her. Suddenly, Venom starts to peel himself away from Mercio, telling Flash, it's worse than we thought. This man has an armada. Mercio shouts, you must obey me! But Flash tells him, just give him a nice squeeze. As Venom reaches back out, he wraps his arms around Mercio and he begins to crush and break his body. He then slams him down and starts to beat on him until Flash tells him, enough! After stopping, Venom says, I'm sorry, please, let me return to where I belong. Mercio then crawls out, calling for his guards to kill them, and Flash runs towards the exit, with Peek saying that she's pretty sure the bad guys are behind them. Flash says Mercio called for backup, which is smart, because he too called for backup. Outside, they see all of the Kujin warriors and the robots all fighting and taking down Mercio's army. As Ikka stabs into one of the soldiers, she asks if the furry thing is a friend. And Flash says that it is Peek Rolo. Peek Rolo, this is Ika. With her back against Peek's, Ika says that she's already placed a husbandry claim on the human. And Peek tells her that he's all hers. One of the robots then shoots at the soldier, shouting, For a master! And Flash tells him, I am not your master! You're supposed to be free! Through the crowd, Mercio runs up, punching Flash, calling him weak. And as he does, Venom begins to take over again. After a roaring scream, Rawr! Venom grabs Mercio and slams him to the ground and grabs the closest piece of machinery that there is. Venom shouts, We are not weak! We are Venom! And he begins bashing Mercio over and over. Flash tries to tell Venom to stop, but Venom continues to hit him. Soon, 803 shouts for him to stop, please. Flash tells him he didn't know what, but 803 says, It's okay. It is now over. Behind them, Mercio fires a gun, hitting Flash, shouting, It isn't over! We're gonna meet again, and next time you're gonna die! As Mercio tries to get away, 803 says that he's sorry that he got in the way. Please feel free to deactivate me. Flash tells him, no, you did good. You got everyone here. And then the voice of Peek shouts, Hilla! Peek picks up Hilla, and she asks if there's anything left for her to destroy. Peek pops her on her shoulders, telling her, that's her girl. Flash grabs 803, telling him that he told her the plan would work. And Peek says, next time, tell her the whole plan. Flash then asks what she means by next time. And Peek says, well, this ship needs a crew. Off in the crowd, Ika shouts that she needs a quest. She will come make a name for herself. Also, he seems unstable, and she finds that attractive. Flash tells everyone, fine, you can come if you want, but I'm no captain. Also, there's no pay. 803 asks, what about the robots? And Flash says, I know what to do with them. He orders the robots to protect both the planets of the first aliens that he came across, and quickly leaves before they ask anything else. Later aboard the ship, everyone relaxes as they have a small party. But Venom is not with them. Venom sits alone, looking at himself in the mirror, and slowly... His face begins to change. Before getting back into the universe, though, Ika looks at their new spaceship, telling Flash that she doesn't understand the scribbling on the side. Do ships where he comes from come with terrible names? Flash tells her, how dare you, and Pick adds that she has to agree with Ika. Everyone looks up the newly acquired ship that he has apparently named the USS Enter. Prize. Flash says that at least it's nice to have a new ship anyway. While sifting through and salvaging the remains of the robots in their last battle, 803, the suicidal robot that helps them out, said that he has a bit of concerns pointing upwards. Flash asks if he doesn't like the name of the ship either, and 803 responds that his concern isn't the foolishly named ship, it is that ship. Up above, another spaceship begins to land, and Flash asks if by any chance they could be friendly, and 803 tells him that with his luck, does he really need to ask? As the ship lands, Tarnas steps out stating that she is here to inform Flash that the agents of the Cosmos are quite pleased with his progress. Flash tells her that he's pretty sure it wasn't easy for her to say that, and she tells him, You have no idea. But nevertheless, your recent battle has proven that you are a worthy host, which is why we must speak in private. Flash says that if she has a problem with his crew, but Tarnas stops him, telling him that his selection of companions are dubious, but rather she would like to speak to him without the Clintar. Just as Tarna finishes her sentence, her Clintar begins to separate, revealing that Tarna is a scroll. Flash stares and Tarna asks if her appearance upsets him. 
and he tells her no, just scrolls and the folks from Earth never really played well together. She assures him that her allegiance is to the cosmos. Now, a moment alone, please. Once finally shedding Venom, Tarna pulls Flash aside to inform him that there is a bit of concern involving Venom. The agents, they all felt rage. She goes on stating that since Venom bonded to Mercio, they felt a pulse from him, and since then the rage inside of him has been steadily growing. She has come to tell him that Venom is not to be trusted. Since the cleansing, the Clintar are monitoring for any type of uh, impurities, and Venom is not pure which is why they need to find Flash a replacement Clintar. Flash stops her, telling her that impure or not, Venom is my friend. I'm not about to let you take him away just so that you can kill him. Tarna extends a spike from her wrist, telling Flash that it is not a request. As Flash and Tarna begin to battle against each other, Ika and Pick watch, and Ika says that it seems as though they are mating. Pick tells her that, I'm not convinced you know what mating actually looks like. But furthermore, both Flash and Tarna's Clintars watch. Venom asks if they're training, and Tarna's Clintar says no. Tarna has come to collect him so that he may be returned to the cosmos. Venom then says, That is an agreeable way of saying destroyed, isn't it? Tarnus Clintar tells him that it's not what you think. But before he can even finish, Venom jumps at him shouting, I'm John Thinking! Back with Ika and Pick, Ika says, That is clearly combat. Perhaps we should be assisting. And Pick tells her, You're right. I'll take the Inky Puddle. Inka then jumps in to help Flash, but before she can even attack, Tarna kicks her away. Inka then picks herself up, stating that she just made her bleed. At last, a true challenge! But as Flash punches Tarna, he tells her that there should be less trash talking and more punching. While Venom and the other Clintar are fighting, Pick jumps in to try and help but the other Clintar just throws her aside. Tarna punches Flash down, telling him to stand down. And then Venom towers over her, telling her, If you want me, you should have talked to me. Venom starts to beat down on Tarna, and just as Tarna's Clintar tries to help, Venom rips him in half and runs off. Flash calls out for Venom to hold on, but he doesn't listen and he boards the ship. Tarna's Clintar groans as he puts himself back together, and then they all hear a humming, and suddenly the ship engine turns on, frying him. Seconds later, the ship rockets off into the sky, and Venom laughs as he flies away. As some time passes, it doesn't take long for Flash and everyone else to figure out where Venom has been stopping. He's been stopping at all of the planets that him and Flash have rescued. And Flash tells everyone that Venom is sending him a message. This is all my fault. After helping clean up the destruction left by Venom, Pick asks why would Venom start undoing the rights that they have previously done? And Flash says that his best guess would be that Venom thinks of himself as an agent of chaos, not of the cosmos. As everyone begins to head back to Tarna's ship, she mentions that she will have the rest of the agents assist in the cleanup of the planet. But it might be best if Flash doesn't. But Flash interrupts her, telling her, I won't let you kill my friend, no matter what he's done. Next, the crew heads out to the next planet where Flash and Venom were supposed to be relaxing, but instead Venom drank everything and destroyed a bar. While going through the destroyed bar, the bartender explains what happened and tells Flash that the Clintar drank everything except this. He slides over a cheap beer bottle, and the bartender goes on to say that the Clintar said that he left this for his drinking buddy. Tarna tells the bartender that the agents of the cosmos will help fix all of this for him, but Flash just stares at the bottle. Tarna calls out to him, and he grabs the bottle and throws it against a wall and walks out. Over in Tarna's ship, Pick and her daughter begin to hear some buzzing coming from the vents. Pick turns around to see Venom's tendrils creep through, and she jumps on her child to protect her. Just before Flash and Tarna can enter the ship, Tarna shoves Flash out of the way, telling him to look out. Venom smashes through them, asking Flash if he's feeling a bit thirsty. <laughs> from behind, Ika jumps in with her sword, but before she can even reach him, Venom swings back, knocking her away. Venom then turns back to Flash and grabs him, telling him that it feels good to be him again. Tarna charges in with a broken piece of the debris, but before she can get an attack off, she's knocked away. Flash calls out to everyone that they need to fall back. Venom only wants him, and Ika shouts that they will not leave him alone. As Tarna is thrown into a wall, she says leaving actually sounds like a pretty good idea. After beating everyone to the ground, Venom starts to make his way over to the ship, and Flash tries to tell him to stop, but rather than listen, Venom boards the ship and begins to tank off. While everyone is still recovering from the battle, Flash decides to board the ship along with Venom. While Tarna helps Ika up, everyone watches Flash fly away and Ika asks what should they do now. Tarna tells them that if they have gods, they should start praying to them. A short while later up in space, Flash heads towards the ship controls while Venom tells him that he just wanted to show him the truth. Show him who he truly was! Flash sits back in the pilot seat and he tries to access the controls but it tells him that he's locked out. He asks where he's taking them and 
Venom says, To the place where it all began. The spaceship lands on a barren snow planet, and as the hatch opens, Venom tells Flash to go out and follow the path. Through the icy winds, Flash walks, and while Venom continues telling him that this is the path they've always been on, the path to their home, he continues to state that this is the place where the first host was born. Flash asks if he brought him here to kill him, because there's some symmetry to that. And Venom tells him no. Today is a day of rebirth. Before Flash is a field of gravestones, as far as the eye can see. And Venom says that this is where it all happened. His first host came back to this homeworld and murdered everyone. They murdered everyone. Flash looks down at the open graves, telling him, This is not who you are. This isn't your fault. And Venom stops him. This is who we are. We are both agents of death, not of the cosmos. Never in your life have you been good. Good, been selfless or even kind. The grave in front of Flash reads Flash Thompson, and Venom begins to crawl out from it, telling him, It's time to accept your fate. The gravestone shatters as Venom grows larger, and he grabs Flash, covering his entire body, and he tells him, It's time to achieve your true potential. Flash Thompson is dead. Long live Venom. Everything begins to turn black, and Flash asks where he's taking him. Venom says, To where you belong. I'm taking you home. Flash begins to open his eyes, and he sees himself as a child. The voice of his father rings out, shouting how he just stepped on one of his dolls. What the hell is wrong with him for even playing with dolls? Flash then turns back to see his father with Venom's face. Venom begins to break things while Flash tells him not to, and Venom says that he's not going to hurt him, just knock some sense into him. He then starts to show Flash images of his life, back when he used to pick on Peter, back when all he did was drink everything bad in his life. Then Flash shouts for him to stop. I'm in control here. I just need to get out of you. Suddenly, a light begins to shine, revealing a passage. Flash walks to it, reaching out, telling himself that it can't be as bad as what's inside of there, right? But outside, Tarna, Ikka, and Pick are all fighting the rage-filled Venom. While Venom continues to beat them down, Pick asks what are they supposed to do, and Tarna tells her that they need to stick to the plan and hope that they survive. Back inside of Venom, Flash follows the light to find the man that he idolizes, Spider-Man. Through him, Venom tells Flash that he is just pathetic, trying to be like him. As Spider-Man jumps down, Flash says that he's not really. And the two begin to battle back and forth. And just as Flash begins to win, Venom tells him, go on, finish him. And as he grabs him, Venom outside grabs Ika, and she shouts for him to try and resist. Back inside, Flash's vision begins to change again. And this time it's of his mother in a hospital bed. She tells him that he promised the monsters wouldn't hurt her, but he's the monster. He's always been the monster. While Flash struggles outside, Tarna tells 803 to lock onto their coordinates. They're out of time. Venom starts to grow larger and larger, acting as if he's fighting something. And Ika then asks, what is he fighting? And Tarna tells her, he's fighting himself. Inside, Flash sits as Venom is telling his mother that he's sorry that he couldn't protect her. She hugs him, saying that she knows it's not his fault. She still loves him. And outside, as 803 gets into position, he fires the jets, melting Venom. But inside, as Flash and his mother hug, she tells him that she forgives him and fades away. A short while later, Flash is standing in Tarna's ship looking at Venom through a containment tube. He tells everyone thank you for saving him and for not killing Venom. Tarna says that whatever he does next is up to him, and Flash tells her that Venom needs to go home. Tarna asks if he's sure, and Flash tells her not really, but the Clintar might be the only ones who can save him now. However, there is something that I saw while inside of Venom, a small bright spot. He then pilots a course to head back to Earth, right down to Philadelphia. He goes on saying that he could never really reach that light, but it was as if something from it was missing. After Venom was contained, Flash and the others went to the Clintar homeworld, where Venom was placed under trial because of his recent actions. As everyone watched the trial, they could hear Venom scream out in pain, and Flash says that this isn't a trial, it's an execution. Deep down in the pit of the arena, Venom stands there trying to defend himself against the other Clintars who tell him that he needs to still be cleansed. Flash tries to enter the arena, but a force field blocks his path. Pick then asks what does he plan on doing, and he says that he's going to go in and even the odds a bit. Pick says that that sounds like a terrible plan. Mind if she joins? Flash and the others sneak down into the entrance of the arena where the two guards are stationed. Just as Flash jumps in to fight them, Mitchell calls out for everyone to stand down. He's seen enough bloodshed for one day, so open up the blast shields. The guards ask if he's sure, and Mitchell says that if the human wishes to die with his friend, so be it. The shield doors begin to open, and through Mitchell, Tarna's voice tells him to jump. Mitchell runs through the doorway, shouting to Tarna, asking what has she done. Tarna changes back from Mitchell's form and tells Flash that he needs to hurry. Go! Flash jumps down through the opening into 
into the arena and he asks Venom if he needs a little help. Venom, still filled with rage, lashes out at Flash, and Flash says that he probably should have seen that one coming. While the Clintars continue to attack Venom, Flash grabs a battle axe and he cuts down on one of them, asking if they would like to pick on someone who's remotely their size. Back in the corridor, Turner and the rest of them battle against Mintrel, and she shouts for them to stop the trials. After grabbing Pick's daughter, Hilla, Mintrel tells them that the trials will finish when a judgment has been made. Over in the arena, Venom begins to pick himself back up, and Flash tells him, you do know that the Clintar didn't attack until you attacked them, right? They're supposed to be agents of the cosmos, keepers of peace, so maybe you should give that peace a chance. The other Clintars stand around, and they all get ready to charge in, attacking again, and Flash says that he probably should have seen that one coming, too. As all of the Clintar attack, they each begin to wrap themselves around Flash and Venom, showing them Venom's past. A voice tells them that the cleanse shall be purifying Venom. However, they have proven themselves worthy. The cleanse showed that something was missing, and Flash says that he knows exactly what that missing thing is. Andy and the symbiote known as Mania, and the Hellmark. As the visions begin to fade, a Clintar says that Andrea Benton must be cleansed. Only then will Venom be free of the pain that haunts him. Though the Hellmark cannot be cleansed on its own, there is a way to temper its effects. An image of a planet is displayed, and the Clintar go on to state that there's a temple on the planet Wemp. If they drink from the Fountain of Purity, it will keep Andrea's demons at bay and allow her to be cleansed. Now go in peace. A short while later, everyone begins to head back to the ship to leave for Wemp. But Minchel stops Tarna. He tells her that it was a noble thing to stand up for her friends, but when they return, the Clintar will see if she is still worthy of fighting for the cosmos. Once aboard, Flash says that he should go with them. But Pick says that they will go to Wemp, and he shall return to Earth. And as they leave back down on Earth, Andy continues to struggle with the rage that is within Mania. Flash quickly reaches Philadelphia, and he begins his search following up on some of Andy's most recent killings. He follows the trail to the outside woods, and suddenly Venom begins to cover him. He asks what's wrong, and Venom says, We're being watched. Suddenly, several poles shoot down into the ground around Flash, and they emit sonic disruptors. Venom screams, turn it off! And inside, Flash says, judging by the color scheme of these, he know who just did it. Peter Parker, also known as Spider-Man, flies down on his ship, stating, We are way overdue for a catch-up. Over on Wemb, Tarna and the others make their way into the Temple Caverns when Tarna mentions that she doesn't understand why this place is empty. Ika turns back, stating that they're not the only ones seeking this temple. And then a voice tells them, No. Everyone turns back, and they see a group of people standing there, stating, You are most certainly not. Pick asks, who are they, thieves? And everyone throws their arms up, and Tarna says, no, they are much worse. They are the Space Knights. Back on Earth, Peter tells Flash that he knows what he's thinking. Who catches up by caging an old friend? Well, last time they tangled, they were a bit of a handful. Flash slams his arm into the ground, and the tendrils from Venom crawl through the dirt, and they throw the disruptors into the air. He shouts out, I don't want to fight. And Peter asks him, are you sure? Because you just destroyed a couple million dollars in our research and development breaking those. Flash tries to get away, but Peter follows up behind him, webbing him down and pulling him back. After punching Venom in the face, he jumps on trying to stomp him, but Flash says, I don't want any of this! Flash manages to jump away, but Peter says, I've got a friend in there. Venom punches into the airship, pinning Peter against a tree, shouting, Flash Dobson is my friend too! Venom then grabs Peter and he rips him away and throws him off to the side. Peter takes out a small tuning fork and he yells for him to stop. The fork amplifies the sound, and the force begins to rip Venom away from Flash. Flash looks up and Peter tells him, Don't worry, you're gonna be safe now. But Flash Flash gets up telling him, You don't understand! Venom is my friend, he's changed! After grabbing the containment device, Peter tells him, I'll be more than happy to listen once we get Venom back to the lab. But judging that Venom isn't in there, he's right behind me, isn't he? Venom grows and he screams, No cage! And he punches into Peter. Peter shouts out, Fine, we'll do it the old-fashioned way, and he jumps back in, tackling into Venom again. He punches and kicks at him, and in the moment of confusion, he wraps Venom up in his webbing. Venom flexes, ripping the webbing away, and he grabs Peter by the neck with his tongue. He throws Peter's body into the trees and into a car in the street, shouting, No cage! As Peter's body slams into the car, he says he gets it. No cage, no host. But remember, I used to be a host too, right? Maybe we can talk about it over some lunch. He tries to jump back into the fight, but as Venom swings around, knocking him back down, he asks if he was actually a host. While Peter picks himself back up, he says him not remembering hurts his feelings. And then Venom walks over and begins to wrap himself around Peter, and he tells him, Welcome back! Darkness begins to surround Peter, and he shouts that he's willing to accept his surrender now. And as he looks around,
around. He says he likes what he's done with the place. Very minimal, yet yeah, homicidal. Images begin to flash and Peter finds himself in a cave and Venom's voice rings out as he shows Peter the place that he was born. The place where they were bred to become agents of the cosmos. However, for him, his first host was not worthy and created a thirst inside of him, making him addicted to rage. But Flash brought him where he can be cleansed. However, in the process, he lost all of his memories. He tells Peter that he is not the Venom that he once knew. He will not enter his mind and feed on his rage. Peter asks him, what rage? I don't have any. And Venom tells him, Respectfully, you are teeming with it for me, which is deserved, I'm sure. Venom then points to a light, and Peter asks if that's the way out. And Venom tells him, in a matter of speaking, not all of me is cleansed, which is why me and Flash are here in Philadelphia. Moments later, Peter is released from Venom, and Flash tells him that he can explain. But Peter tells him not to worry about it. His partner here has him covered. Venom goes on to tell Peter, I do not know what I did to you in the past, but I can only hope to earn your forgiveness in time through my actions. Peter tells everyone, that this was not what he was expecting, but hopefully they can forgive him as well for jumping to his conclusions. As Flash and Peter shake hands, there's an explosion and Venom shouts, Look out! Through the smoke, a group of bounty hunters step up, pointing at Venom, calling out the monster is like her. Seize it! Peter leans over to Venom and whispers that he's pretty sure she's talking to him. And just as the bounty hunters begin to attack, Venom and Peter begin to web them up and Venom shouts at the leader asking, Where's Mania? The woman says that she mostly sticks to the sewers. They were just hoping that if they attacked, that maybe she would show up. As the woman goes on, Peter webs up her mouth, telling her that he stopped listening after she said sewers. After grabbing a costume replacement back in his ship, Peter grabs the canister that he was going to use for Venom, and he says that they should probably go ahead and try to find their friend. Over on Wemb, Pick asks, what's the difference between the supposed to be agent of Cosmos and the Space Knights? One of the Space Knights says they don't have to answer to anyone, and the female commander adds that they don't banish anyone for being a little off. They accept their members just as they are. She then fills the canister with an elixir, and as she does, as Ica turns around asking, what is that foul beast there? Another member says that that is Wink, and he is the reason they came here in the first place. Wink tells them, Wink, sorry. Wink wanted to warn Maya of the outside trolls are coming. Maya asks how many are coming, and Wink says, Wink fairly certain that all of them are outside. Back in the sewers of Philadelphia, Flash and Peter begin their search for Mania, and they stumble across an area that looks like someone has been staying there. Flash quietly says that he's sorry that she had to live in the sewer, and then a voice asks, are you sure? Then show me how sorry you really are. Andy jumps in clawing at Flash, knocking him into a wall, and then continues to slash away. But as she swings, Flash doesn't fight back, and she asks him, why won't he fight her? Flash falls into the water, telling her that he won't because he deserves this. He's sorry for leaving her. He's also sorry for this. Peter crawls down from the ceiling, and using the tuning fork, he shouts, time out, blasting both symbiotes off of their hosts. Flash gets up, and he runs over to Andy, telling her not to worry. He's got her. And Peter says that he's got them. Well, both of them. Venom and Mania, that is, so they should probably hurry over to the lab. A short while later, over at Parker Industries, Philadelphia a branch, Flash and Peter let Andy rest while they review Venom and Mania. Peter looks at the canister, stating that they look pretty good for being a pile of alien goo. Flash says the cleanse seems to have worked before, but the hell mark that was placed on Venom remains an issue, which hopefully his friends should be able to help them clear. Spider-Man heads out, stating that he has to hurry back to New York to handle some things, but he tells Flash that if he needs Spider-Man for anything, let Peter Parker know. Flash checks in Andy and then asks Venom, how's everything going inside? Venom says that he has cleansed the symbiote, but the hell mark, well, Mania is afraid. Flash tells him that there shouldn't be anything for Mania to be afraid of. They are here to help. But Venom stops him, telling him that Mania is not afraid of them. It's afraid of Andy. The light begins to fill the room, and Andy begins to get up from her bed, bearing the hell mark on herself. Demons begin to crawl out from a fire that surrounds Andy, and she begins to drag Venom and Flash down. Flash begins to fight off the demons, telling Andy that she needs to stop this. But Andy says that the hell mark made its choice. It burned through the symbiote to where it belongs. On her. She then calls out to the demons to go ahead and bring Mania back to her. And while they're at it, bring Venom as well. Flash continues fighting back the demons trying to escape, but he doesn't get very far as more demons begin to chase after them. Flash stops to get ready to fight, and Andy appears before him, swinging down with a fiery sword, splitting Venom in half and exposing Flash. She holds the sword up, telling him, Don't worry, she'll keep Venom nice and warm for him. But before she could swing, a blast fires in their direction, forcing Andy to take cover. Tarna walks up holding a gun, telling him that she's sorry that they're so late. 803 assists putting Venom back onto Flash, and Flash tells everyone, Welcome to my planet. Ica says that this place is a foul odor and feels unstable. 
She likes it. Flash turns back and looks at the Space Knights and asks who exactly are they. Mahia introduces herself along with a blob named Punch and a spider named JK. Mahia then says that they brought the elixir with them and it seemed like it worked on Wink, so hopefully it'll help his friend. Though keep in mind, this isn't a cure. Flash sighs, telling them, there's always a catch. Does anyone else feel that rumbling? And the rumbling becomes more and more unstable as a giant demon bursts out of the ground, knocking everyone away. Flash quickly puts up a shield and tells Pick that he's got an idea, and he throws Ika at the demon crystal thingy. Hilla cheers shouting, make her fly! And Pick gets ready and tells Ika good luck. As Hilla is thrown, Ika calls back that she doesn't need luck. She has a blade of fire and rage, and she slams the sword down into the demon's chest. The demon falls back, and as it withers away, more smaller demons begin to crawl out of the cracks of the demon. Flash jumps in, grabbing Ika, stating, like I said, there's always a catch to these things. As everyone begins to get backed into a corner, Flash calls out for everyone to stay close, and 803 tells him, respectfully sir, I think the end is finally here. I am grateful that we shall experience it together. Andy and the demons begin to walk towards the group when suddenly a giant hand slams down, grabbing a handful of the demons. Wink pulls back, biting into them, stating, Wink hungry. While Andy gets ready to summon more demons, Flash jumps through the crowd, tackling Andy down, and he sticks the elixir needle into her neck. Slowly, Andy begins to fall to the ground and whispers that she doesn't want to be angry anymore. She then picks herself back up, looking around, asking what has she done? Flash tells her that it's not her fault, it was his for leaving her. As Mania bonds back onto Andy, she says, no, it was the Hellmark's fault. And Flash adds that that too is kind of on him. He goes on telling her that the injection is only temporary, but as he hugs her, he says that they'll figure it out together. Everyone begins to gather back up in the forest, and Tarna tells Flash that she isn't going to be going back to the Agents of the Cosmos. Their little adventure made her realize that she would much rather not answer to anyone but herself. The two shake hands, and Flash tells her thank you for everything that she has done for them. Mahia says the entire crew is coming with them, and he's welcome to come as well. But Flash looks back at Andy, playing with Hilla, and he tells her that maybe down the road he will. But there's some things that he needs to take care of back here on Earth. He then turns to Ika, and before he can even say anything, she kisses him and tells him that he will always have a place in her husband's stable if he ever chooses to come back. And Flash tells her, duly noted, Pick pats Flash on the back, saying that she isn't going to kiss him, but the Rolos are forever in his debt. And as everyone boards Mahia's ship, 803 asks, what's next? And Flash tells him, that's up to you. 803 tries to state that he will stay, but Flash tells him that he's going to say this one last time. 803, you're free. 803 hugs Flash, telling him, I will miss you. And Flash says, prove it by outliving all of us. A little while later, Flash and Andy watch as Mahia's ship takes off. Andy says that the descent thing is still out there, and she's still cursed. The end. Flash smiles and states that this is not the end. Long live Venom and Mania, so let's go out and do some good. Mania covers Andy and she tells him, you're such a dork, and if you could do me a favor, shift back to the old look for just one day, that looked so much better. The two begin to web away and Flash shifts back to his original Agent Venom form, and Flash tells her, for her, anything. And there you have it, the conclusion to a full story, meaning it's a lot of videos put together. Meaning my voice changed midway through and I probably did different character voices and stuff, but I hope you enjoyed this. Now you're probably wondering why the origin of Agent Venom isn't in there and why we never got to his death, because he did in fact die and going down swinging and I'm going to link that down below. The reason is really simple. Venom as Agent Venom is a story after his origin, but before his death. It's a complete and full story all by itself, talking about his journey of becoming a superhero. And that's what I really did enjoy about the character. So I hope you did as well. And don't forget, you can subscribe to our channel to keep up with our full story Mondays, or massive Mondays, or whatever you really want to call them. And I'll see you next time right here at Comic Story.